Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of February 5th, 2015. Thank you very much for coming and joining us tonight. My name is Councilor Bill Dwight. I'm the Council President. I'll be presiding tonight. Uh, we will start as we start every meeting with our traditional uh, opportunity for the public to speak to us and share with us their thoughts and, and ideas. Um, we ask that as you, uh, I have you in the sign-up sheet, I'll call your name, and as I call your name, if you will come up, restate your name so you can correct my mispronunciation, and then also your address. I appreciate that. Your remarks, please keep your remarks to under three minutes. Three minutes isn't the goal, it's, it's the end, so if you could do that. We have a lot of people signed up. We'll all be very old if everyone goes over that. Uh, speaking point and we probably won't have the ability to remember what anyone said at that point. Uh, also I would ask, I don't, I can't require it, but I would ask that anyone who has heard a point that they were prepared to make made already, maybe consider just saying ditto on that respect, but you're welcome to speak on any topic not relative to anything we're discussing tonight. Um, and with that, we will start off with Bill Deal. Good evening. I'm Bill Deal. I'm the Executive Director of the Collaborative for Educational Services in Northampton. I live at 75 Gothic Street in Northampton. <clears throat> uh, uh, the, we own and operate the Heck Academy, which is on Pleasant Street and abuts the property at 256 Pleasant Street, where the proposed housing project is, is supposed to occur. So I want to address that particular housing project. I have two points I want to make. I'll try to do it quickly as the clock ticks down. Um, First of all, I agree with many of the neighbors and abutters that the Valley CDC could have done a better job at soliciting input from the community earlier on. But they did solicit a lot of input the last two months, it was incorporated into their new plans. We had several different suggestions and concerns for the, from the academy. They adequately addressed those. So I feel they did do their job in terms of listening to the community and taking that into account. The second point is something I want to talk about in terms of the schools. There was an argument made in Saturday's uh, Gazette that this, was, this project was going to cost the schools $375,000 a year. <clears throat> and that was based on an estimate of 30 students. Each student would cost $12,500. That is, a, a, the math is right, but the figures are very misleading. First of all, the state reimburses the schools a certain amount of that money. Secondly, and more importantly, that figure of $375,000 assumes that 30 students are going to require additional teachers, administrators, et cetera. The right assumption is that 30 students would be spread across 12 grade levels. That would be 2.5 students per grade. One student per class does not require additional teachers, and the state still reimburses us. So in fact, it's a net gain for the schools, not a loss. And the third point I think is very important is many of our neighboring districts are losing students, and when they lose students, they have to curtail, curtail services, cut staff, even close schools. Witness our Worthington neighbors. So it's very incumbent on the city to build affordable housing that will bring additional students into our buildings, into our schools. For those reasons, I support that project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Reverend Peter Ives. I'm Peter Ives. I live at 15 Drives Green, and I was the minister of the First Churches for 22 years. I um, want to support the city councilors who are supporting the use of Community Preservation Act money to support the CDC plan for low-income housing on Pleasant Street. I do it for three reasons. I started my ministry in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I um, was living in a town that was much like Northampton is today. Um, but while I was in Cambridge, I saw what can happen with rapid gentrification, when housing places just leaped, uh, and when we began to lose the strong low-income uh, low income housing, uh, affordable housing base to the city. Um, and North and Cambridge is no longer a Northampton today, and Northampton is going to be more like Cambridge in the future if we're not careful to protect that fundamental base of low-income housing. Uh, secondly, my grandson goes to the Bridge Street School, and I spend a lot of time talking to parents at the Bridge Street School. Uh, and I know how much financial pressure many of the young parents uh, and children are at the Bridge Street School in terms of housing needs. 
Um, many, many parents there need the kind of housing uh, that um, the CDT, CDC is planning to build there on Pleasant Street. And it provides that kind of strong <coughs> base for a community that needs low income housing, middle income housing, and upper income housing. And you don't want to tip the balance uh, in the direction of rapid gentrification as happened in Cambridge. Finally, I, as the Minister of First Churches, was um, honored when all of you voted unanimously to give us a Community Preservation Act grant in order to help us reach the $2 million goal of our capital campaign. And, and that grant allowed us to leverage so much other money that we were able to get towards that $2 million goal. And if you remove that Community Preservation Grant from this CDC project, you have the same problem of toppling all the other money that could come in that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madeline Weaver Blanchett, please. Hi, I'm Madeline Weaver Blanchett, and I live at 41 Valley Street, and I um, am a big proponent of the affordable housing project on the Lumberyard site. Um, people have heard from me a lot, so this evening I'm actually uh, not going to speak for myself, but I'm going to uh, read a letter that my friend Suzanne Farrington um, <coughs> is writing to all of the city councilors, and she lives at 16C Hampshire Heights. Um, dear City Council, I live in Ward 1, and I'd like you to know that I support the development of affordable housing at the former Northampton Lumber Yard. I grew up in Northampton. I love this place, and I so returned here so I could raise my daughter here. I'm a home health aide, and it's been tough supporting our family and affording housing here in Northampton. I was on the public housing list for two years before there was an opening, and we suffered terribly, living in a nearly untenable situation and hoping for a break. I wouldn't wish that fear and uncertainty on anyone. Property and plans such as have been proposed on Pleasant Street don't come along often. Ask yourself, what might be built instead? Another retail-only space? Another fitness facility? How would any of those ideas benefit the majority of Northampton residents, many of whom have family and friends living precariously <clears throat> as we did? I hope you will vote for the plan. It's the right thing to do for more than the entitled few. Thank you, Suzanne Farrington. Thank you very much. Uh, Sharon Moulton, please. My name is Sharon Moulton, and I live at 48 Evergreen Road in Leeds, and I also am here in favor of the low-income affordable housing project for Pleasant Street, and I've been very concerned about affordable housing in Northampton for a long time. I was one of the founders of the Habitat for Humanity um, chapter back in 1989, and the need is only more today than it was then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Tony Hockstad. Well, you already know. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Tony Hockstad. I live at 28 Fruit Street, which, um, for anyone who's not familiar, is surrounded by McDonald House, Cahill Apartments, and the Salva House, as well as the Senior Center. So I'm right in the midst of some affordable housing. And the point I came to make tonight in support of this project as well is that um, I think this has been a long and diligently um, pursued project, that this started probably years ago when the zoning ordinance started to be reviewed. And I think that hundreds, if not thousands of hours have gone into this process. And what I believe is before the council is um, to have recognized that that process happened as it should and that as representatives of this community that you've overseen that every step that needed to be taken has been taken. And at this point, that's what's on the table to be voted for, not to undermine the process and the thousands of hours um, of public process that's already happened. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for those of you in the back, there are two chairs up front here if you want to take those. Someday. 
Oh, okay. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of two former mayors of the city of Northampton. Here we have uh, Mayor Ford and Mayor Higgins here. Uh, I think Mayor Narkowitz is hiding in City Hall. <laughs> um, next up is Bernadette Gibbon. Thanks. Bernadette Giblin, 110 William Street. Um, so let me start by saying ditto to what my friend uh, Peter Ives talked about in terms of all of us in Northampton having to be mindful um, about maintaining the integrity of economic diversity. On a personal note, I've lived in this city for about 30 years right there at Ward 3, not very far at all for where this propo proposed um, development is going to be built. And um, my daughter and my brand new son-in-law, really gainfully employed couple, cannot afford to move into our neighborhood. Uh, and they've got great jobs and they'd love to raise a family here. Um, so the fact that uh, my friend and colleague uh, Joanne over at Valley CDC is um, doing this amazing work that really vetted the project widely to all of us. I think it's really important we get behind it. We um, celebrate how much it's going to enhance the corridor. Um, you know, I've walked that corridor. It's been times it was a really uh, unpleasant place, Pleasant Street. Uh, so it's going to make it a much more pleasant place. It's going to add to the tax base. And it's going to really, I think, celebrate what I find the most incredibly enlivening part of living in Northampton. We're a community that's about compassion. We're a community that's really committed to all our citizenry. And I think that in this time of, you know, incredible change economically for so many people, we're concerned about drugs, we're concerned about our kids at risk, we're concerned about low income people having jobs. They need a place to live. And, and it's a mosaic that puts someone in a certain situation that makes them economically vulnerable. And I hope that we continue as a community to be so mindful about making these people who contribute, who pour our coffees, who work in our restaurants, all of these people deserve a right to live in our beautiful uh, paradise. With that, I'll pass. Thank you very much. Uh, Gail Perlman, please. Mm -hmm. I'm Gail Perlman. Um, my address is 76 Marion Street here in Northampton. I, I'm going to start by saying that no civic project is ever perfect, and nobody knows that better than the folks um, in, on the city council. So this one won't be perfect either. Um, ditto to the things that the supporters have already said about this project. I won't repeat that. But it is an opportunity for us to be able to get behind the concept of diversity in our community in a different way from the way that we often do. We often get behind racial, religious, um, diversity, diversity regarding gender equity. This time we have a chance to do it regarding economic diversity. It's a great opportunity. I take the objectors fully at their word that their criticisms have nothing to do with opposition to the low and moderate income community, but rather to the claimed defects in the structure itself and its effect on the neighborhood. Um, the debate, as others have said, has been full, and you folks have contributed to that by making uh, uh, the forum available a number of times for people pro and con to come in and talk about the project. I, I congratulate you for that and all the others who have done the same thing. But here's the thing, after the full and fair discussion has been had, your role changes a bit. The burden falls on you as the guardians of this city to make the hard decision. And you always have to make it in the face of what I mentioned before, that the project is never perfect. So I want to urge you to make the decision this way. Assume the objections to be accurate. Assume them to be true. And then weigh the losses that the objectors claim against the gains that the proponents predict. Weigh the inevitable imperfections against the multiple values that this project can have for Northampton. I want to suggest that your deliberations should reach the conclusion that those gains outweigh the detriments. And if you recognize that they do, what a wonderful gift it would be to the people who want to, the other funders of this project, to the low and moderate income people themselves, and to all the citizens of Northampton, if you could make this 
a unanimous decision of the City Council. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Greg Rashane. Good evening. Uh, my name is Greg Rashane. Uh, I live at 137 Crescent Street. And uh, I think uh, a lot of folks have said some important things, uh, which I agree with uh, about 99% of in support of this development. Uh, I would add um, uh, a, a detail about semantics, uh, which uh, is minor and major. Um, this is an important project. Uh, this is a low and moderate income housing, right? And it's easy for us to refer to it in that sense. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, what's proposed here uh, is actually uh, 55 homes. Uh, and the difference is that means that 55 families will have an individual experience in these homes uh, at a time. And, 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 and over, over decades, we'll have and see more families than that, many more. Um, but the individual experience of each of these is important to remember uh, because uh, in, in the end, nobody lives in housing. We live, in, we live at home, right? We all want a safe, stable, uh, affordable uh, you know, home that is predictably affordable. Uh, and that's what this will be uh, for any number of families. So I just want to emphasize that detail. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff Napolitano, please. Hi, I'm Jeff Napolitano. I uh, live at uh, 266 Grove Street, uh, and um, I'm, I'm here uh, as a director of the American Friends Service Committee, uh, and I'm here to su express support for the project um, uh, for affordable housing on um, Pleasant Street. Uh, this hasn't been a flawless project, but flawlessness, frankly, isn't achievable. Uh, to echo, um, I think, Ms. Perlman, Judge Perlman, uh, the benefits of this project clearly uh, and far outweigh the criticisms. Uh, I speak here in the tradition of AFAC's support of affordable housing in Florence height, Heights long before my tenure, uh, up to our current collaboration with Springfield No One Leaves uh, to prevent foreclosures and evictions in that city. Other AFSC programs across the country have called for vacant homes to simply be seized and immediately used to home the houseless, to house the homeless, rather. Um, <laughs> houses anyway um, and um, it hardly seems like a radical step for us to endorse this project um, that being said I do know that there are people of goodwill who disagree with my position uh, and I'll simply say that we disagree and that part of being a whole community means finding a way to disagree without rancor uh, I understand the personal nature of this project for proponents and opponents but certainly we can agree to, to disagree um, just on a personal note, seven years ago, my partner and I looked to settle down and raise a family. We looked at Northampton, um, but we didn't have to look for very long to know that we couldn't uh, live here. Uh, when I came to Northampton as a single parent with two kids three years ago, it was a struggle to find an affordable place to live uh, in the city that at that time I had worked for four years. Um, I am far from the uh, most needy of folks in this city or of folks who work in this city, uh, and that should tell you something about the necessity of this project. Uh, I want to thank the folks who have advanced this project thus far, and I want to urge City Council to pass it. There is a popular perception that this city is progressive, um, but only hypocritically, only about issues that don't directly affect them, about wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and so forth. I urge City Council to refute that perception. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Bob Gould, please. OK, I'm completely changing the subject. <laughs> it's your privilege to do so. I've been hearing about this. Thank you for this opportunity to speak before the Council. My name's Bob Gould of Florence. Just moved within Florence to 140 Hill Crest Drive. And I've lived here since 2001. In the past couple of weeks, controversial debating has arisen regarding increasing your salaries, your health benefits, and the institutional racism locally and nationally. Let me talk about these issues with a common solution. As part-time elected officials in Northampton, you must seek your positions based upon citizenship responsibility, wanting to serve its people, even perhaps power and ego, or any other reasons, but I seriously doubt it is for your salaries, either current or soon to be voted on increases that we taxpayers will have to pay. You have selected the option of retaining 
the expense of health benefits. It's the end of that debate. You voted. It's done. So now let's get on with in institutional racism. I have a practical solution for both in this discussion. And I'm going to propose that all part-time elected official salaries be reduced to a stipend of $100 per, per year. This salary difference will be transferred to the Northampton Police Department for establishing improved relationship and communications training, community awareness training, and sensitivity training, all for increasing the awareness of and hopefully to erode any institutional racism that exists in our city's force. Education and training begins the road for improving police community relations. And we pay for this by the transfer of payments from our part-time elected officials who claim to serve for the betterment of the Northampton citizens to a higher educated police force. This could be in addition to establishing a volunteer community police relationship or review board. Think of the unique response, the public's increased perception of you as re responsible elected officials doing something important to eliminate racism and to show your true dedication as elected officials in the city. This is a revenue neutral idea. We are already paying your salaries and benefits, but the citizens of Northampton are currently being highly squeezed financially with all the increases in taxes and fees. This proposal is revenue neutral and would help to support the efforts for eliminating institutional racism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Lois Ahrens, please. Uh, my name is Lois Ahrens. I live on Warfield Place in Northampton. Uh, I'm speaking in support of CPA funds uh, to develop affordable housing for families here. Um, if we want a city close to people other than the current fortunate homeowners and renters who can pay uh, rents unaffordable to many people who work here, then the council should not uh, support this important project. Uh, since I moved here in 1980, Northampton has become increasingly an island off limits to people who are able to move here and live here even if we didn't have a lot of money. I think the city's been enriched in many ways as a result of the influx of new residents that came here in the 70s and 80s. And I, for one, am not interested in living in an island of privilege. <coughs> While some people in Ward 3 have been accused of being NIMBYs, I think this is inaccurate since reality the CDC project is not in people's backyards. It's on Pleasant Street a main thoroughfare with other large buildings and businesses. So if um, the not in my back, so if the not in my backyard position is a, sm a smoke screen, which I believe it is, what is their objection? How exactly would families living on Pleasant Street challenge the neighborhood's identity? And if that identity is based on exclusivity and protecting the status quo, I would say, it's a good thing and a positive thing that that identity is being challenged. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pamela Schwartz. Councilor Pamela Schwartz. Not you get the honor ribbon. <laughs> <laughs> Not get the side then, but you get the honor ribbon. <laughs> um, anyway, good evening, councilors. It is a pleasure, really, and an honor to be here and talk to you from this side of the podium. Um, so, of course, I am here to speak um, in support of the housing project that, uh, at the lumber yard. And um, I want to share with you, not just as a Northampton resident, but as director of the Western Massachusetts Network to End Homelessness. Um, I want to let you know that over the last year, I have been at meetings um, with the then uh, Massachusetts Undersecretary of the Department of Housing Community Development, where Northampton has been spoken of broadcast in meetings where st st across with, with people from across the state from all different stripes, um, leader, fellow leaders at our leadership on affordable housing and, um, and their investment, their commitment, the state's commitment to our commitment. Um, and the, this project has been held up in, it, I mean, held up as an example of that. 
And I've been so proud in those meetings, representing the whole region of my community. I've been proud of my community in Northampton um, on behalf of the network and as a resident. And I've, I, and I've, I've also followed the plans of the project and, and there's been, there was such uh, enthusiasm about the ingenuity of the use of this space. And it's just saddened me deeply to see this version of the debate unfold. And I totally appreciate um, the public process and I respect it and I think it has been thorough, extremely thorough. And I think we've had a give and take and, and now it's time to step forward and do what I know many of you, all of you I know believe in affordable housing. There's no convincing of that. And I think um, the evidence is in that we need to believe in this project. It is an extraordinary opportunity for downtown Northampton and for the citizens of Northampton and to create, to live our values of diversity and accessibility. And I'm proud of you for your leadership and I encourage you to continue it and support this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jennifer Derringer, please. Good evening, Jennifer Derringer, 60 North Street. I am speaking in support tonight of the Lumberyard Project. This project comes to you after an extraordinary amount of process. After four public meetings and much deliberation and input from the community, the CPC unanimously recommended that the City Council award this project $30,000, which is just one sixtieth of the total cost, an enormous bargain for the city. The CPC also required Valley CDC to hold a public meeting, which was well attended by the community. Then, the Planning Board and Central Business Architecture Committee held two joint public hearings, also well attended by the community. Both the Planning Board and Central Business Architecture unanimously approved the project. This project also enjoys the full support of the housing partnership of which I am a member. Valley CDC has responded to community input by making a number of changes to improve the project. The community, including abutters, asked for more commercial space, so Valley more than doubled it to 5,300 square feet, which is almost double the minimum commercial square footage requirement. The community requested changes to the facade. Valley significantly improved the facade. The community requested a reduction in height. Valley reduced the height. Every step of the way, Valley has responded to community input. The process has truly worked. I believe tonight is one of those moments that will define your time on City Council. We have not had an opportunity to build affordable housing for families on this large of a scale in a very long time. Indeed, this is the first such project that has come before the CPC. Notably, even with the approval of this expenditure, the CPC affordable housing expenditures are woefully behind the other categories. To date, CPC has awarded 28% of its funds to both historic preservation and open space, 26% to recreation, and only 17%, including this project, if you vote for it tonight, to affordable housing. Funding this project meets so many goals that this community has prioritized. It is in concert with new zoning regulations. It greatly enhances this critical gateway to Northampton. It provides a huge <coughs> increase in commercial and retail opportunities. And perhaps most importantly, it offers more working class families an opportunity to live in our amazing community. The Housing Partnership Strategic Plan revealed that a full 25% of our community live in unaffordable housing. That is to say they are paying more than 30% of their income in rent. As a legal aid attorney, I have seen these families be evicted because they simply cannot afford their rent. The CPC, Central Business Architecture, and Planning Board have all spent hours vetting this project and gathering community input. Then they each gave it their unanimous support. Our community has long supported the concept of affordable housing and by doing so has embraced families of all economic classes. This, this project is an opportunity to make good on that commitment. This project deserves no less than a unanimous yes vote from all of you. Thank you very much. Um, Susan Stinson, please. <coughs> I'm Susan Stinson. I live in an apartment at 163 Bridge Street in Ward 3. I've lived there nearly 15 years, and I'm also in support of the housing project at the Lumber Yard. I'm a novelist who's faced consistent challenges with how to meet the costs of basic needs like housing. I share those challenges with many other artists who have contributed to making this a great place to be, but be who, because of the cost of housing, are not able to stay in Northampton. 
I want to support this housing project because I feel those pressures every day, and I very much want to be able to stay here. I want this housing project because what is needed now is not just support for the concept of affordable housing, but a carefully planned project that has been adapted in response to the concerns of a community and is ready to move forward now. I want that not just for myself, other artists, and those who benefit from our efforts, but because I want to live in a place that is committed to being home to people of all economic levels. Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah Smith, please. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Sarah Smith, 254 Prospect Street. Um, I've been a resident and taxpayer in Northampton for over 12 years and um, have been a worker downtown for most of the last 20 years. And my phone is dying and I'm Here. losing my notes. I have a backup. <laughs> Thanks, Jazz. Um, I feel so strongly, personally, that our downtown is more vibrant, more attractive, and more sustainable when we welcome diversity in all its forms. I voted in favor of the CPA, and I'm so excited about the opportunity for these funds to be directed towards affordable housing downtown. I'm also here as Director of Development at Safe Passage, which is the organization addressing domestic violence in Hampshire County. Survivors of domestic violence are at great risk for severe economic setbacks. Very often, when a survivor chooses to leave an abusive relationship, they also make the choice to leave behind economic security. It is a sad reality that many survivors must live in poverty in order to keep themselves and their kids safe. As a result, many of Safe Passage's clients qualify for subsidized housing. But as we know, there are many more families who qualify than there are affordable housing units here in Northampton. CPA funding is meant to support affordable housing projects, and we have not had many proposed projects that take advantage of this resource that I and so many other Northampton taxpayers supported. Our community is so supportive of survivors of domestic violence. Safe Passage has donors stretching back to the early 80s who have supported us ever since. Thousands of Northampton residents support the hot chocolate run every year. Through their financial support, our donors and our community is saying to survivors, we support you. We value you and we want to help you. Unfortunately, the housing market in Northampton says you don't belong here. We strongly support the Lumberyard Project because it is such a valuable and unique so use of CPA funds. This project will bring affordable housing to people who really need it. The unique part is that the location will bring so much more to its residents, including many resources that survivors need to recover from violence and to become economically stable. They need access to transportation, employment, economic opportunities, services, and so much more that our wonderful downtown has to offer. We at Safe Passage are asking all city councilors to follow our, commu our community's lead to vote yes and tell survivors you belong here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Todd Weir, please. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Todd Weir. I live at 124 Mosier Street. I'm the senior pastor at First Churches in Northampton. And the issue uh, that I want to add to the Valley CDC project is what the affordability gap really looks like here in Northampton. Uh, according to the 2010 census, we had a gap uh, where 24% of renters in this city are in a category called severely housing distressed. Now, what does that mean? It means they're paying more than 50% of their income on housing. And I went and saw, how many people is that? That's 1,100 plus individuals and families. 1,100 households in this community are paying more than 50% of their income in housing. That's a lot. The other statistic I found really interesting is what's the affordability gap at the level of income where people are at 50% of median, that's the lowest income level they track, is 50% of median income. We have a gap of 420 units for that income group. That's a really large gap, and we're talking about 55 units in this project. And I just want to put it out there that that's the bigger picture 
that we have to face in the affordability gap in this city. That's a lot to make up. And the way I see that at First Churches is uh, we in lots of religious communities spend a lot of time uh, collecting canned goods for pantries and soup kitchens and meal programs. And that need keeps going up and up. And it's not feeding people who are homeless. It's feeding people who have homes and can't make ends meet. And the solution isn't that we collect more canned goods. We need affordable housing, and we need a lot of it in this community. And I also just want to briefly speak as someone who's uh, been the president of a board of a neighborhood development company, and I've managed projects like the Valley CDC program in the past. And in hindsight, I can go back and see projects that we did that were tax credit deals in New York. And I can go back 10 years later, and I can see them and all the same concerns in the neighborhoods were there and they're important concerns. But I just want to say that a well-managed program uh, can really become an anchor in a community. It can lead to revitalization and it can be an asset for the local <coughs> community as well. And what I've seen from Valley CDC, I just want to express my confidence in them and their professionalism and in their process. And I think they can do the same thing for us here in Northampton and start to close this really critical affordability gap. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, oh. Damn it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can't, I'm <clears throat> oh, 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 uh, um, uh, on 30 Orchard Street, is it Sharon? Sharon? Me, it's oh, Sharon. sorry. Shoshana. Shoshana. I would strive to be a better. Shoshana, I, okay. I would strive to be a better speaker than I am a uh, handwriter. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> My handwriting gets worse every year. It's not you. Um, just as HEC students come from all backgrounds, so do we. And I want to say uh, that I'm here to support the Lumberyard Project for several reasons. Um, Though many of us have spoken about being kind to some kind of other person who needs help, I'd like to submit that it's all of us who have needed or will need that help sometime in our lives. We will all hopefully get to be old and may live on a limited income at that point. Many of us did not grow up wealthy. I remember my mother struggling like crazy um, as a single mom to make the rent. Um, students that I've had have been desperately poor and or homeless. It's all of us. Um, we're all in this together. Uh, that's important to remember when we think about this. Um, I will echo in the interest of not taking my full time. What others have said about the due process this project's been given, I think above and beyond, um, both by the council who's striven, who's striven to do that, and also by the modifications to the plans. Um, when I moved here, the neighbors on my block were a bartender, a couple of Korean war vets, a home health aide, a cafeteria worker at the elementary school, an auto body mechanic, um, and almost all of them were gone. Um, some of them grew old and left for good reasons of their own. Um, many more could no longer afford to live on my block, and that's not the block I chose. It's not the block I want to live on, and it's not the kind of block I grew up on. Um, so I would just submit to all of us that the horse has left the barn on the, on, on the redesign of this thing. It's been done, it's been done, it's been redone. And what's left now is um, for us all to do the right thing, not only for other people, but for ourselves. At some time in our life, we will all need um, the support of our community. That's what this is for. Thanks. Thank you very much. Jonathan Wright, please. Good evening, Jonathan Wright, 91 Olander Drive. Um, what everyone has said, lots of dittos. Um, I'll add to that. I just have three things I want to comment on. As an employer, I've seen over the last uh, 41 years that um, the distance that people have to travel to work is increasing. And the less you make, the farther you have to travel to work, the more expensive it is. The more expensive it is for daycare. Uh, I have a young woman uh, this morning who described what it was like in these last snowstorms to get up in Heath in time to get her son to daycare in Colerain to get to Northampton for 7 o'clock. Um, so <coughs> supporting the workforce that we have here through affordable housing is critical uh, as an economic development piece. So I really support the project from that standpoint. I would just comment as a developer, a, a occasional developer, that a project of this scale is really hard. It takes six or seven funders. It takes a long time. And they've done a very good job. I've looked at the site plan, at the building design, the materials. This is durable. It's well thought out. And it will be here uh, over the long term. 
which is my third point, um, building affordable housing is terrific. Keeping it affordable and keeping it well maintained requires an agency with real, uh, with real legs. And the Valley CDC has shown us over decades that they are that entity, well managed, well run, well funded, a great board, and, uh, and, a, and a record to prove it, you know, to support that. So it's a great opportunity. It's a, it's a small piece, but it's a, a critical piece for your vote tonight, and I encourage you to make it unanimous. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. Richard Wagner, please. Hi, I'm Richard Wagner. I live at 48 Lyman Road, which is the bleeding edge of Ward 3, if you don't know. Um, I'm here as a private citizen, but uh, much of what I have to say is informed by my work with the Northampton Community Arts Trust. I think most of you know of what we're trying to do, the project, which is to bring, um, to, to provide affordable space for creative work in Northampton. Um, now, there's, there's, an, there's a flip side to that, which took me a while to realize, but now I realize it. If, one wants to provide affordable space for creative work, you need to provide affordable space for creative workers. Um, it's, it's a, I guess, an unfortunate truth that, that those who want to enrich our cultural landscape tend not to be financially enriched by their work. Um, so if, you know, my interest over the past year or so has been with this project, it behooves me to come up as a citizen to, to just lend another voice in support of the Lumberyard project. Um, because, you know, it's over the years, much of the pop, vibrancy, heart, soul, funkiness, oddity, bizarreness of Northampton has been born by creative types. And um, I think this project and our project and keep <clears throat> here in this community. That's all I got. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, J.P. Kaczynski, please. <clears throat> Counselor. <clears throat> i got to get everyone's titles up. This <clears throat> J.P. Kaczynski. My family own, and my wife and I own the property next door to the Lumberyard Project. I am a counselor in another community and I've had the opportunity to vote many times for affordable housing projects because I support affordable housing, ditto for many of the reasons you've all mentioned. Uh, I'd love to speak in favor of the project, this project tonight, and give it my endorsement. But I believe in good affordable housing projects and I don't believe this is a good plan for a number of reasons. You know that Northampton is one of the communities in the entire state that has exceeded the state's goal for affordable housing. We're doing a good job. So we don't have to accept a bad plan, a mediocre plan, or an okay plan. We should endorse the best plan possible for our community. This isn't a 40B community where someone can come in and put any type of housing you want. Northampton has met its goal. <clears throat> According to the Pioneer Valley Regional Housing Plan in 2014, 56% of all CPA housing expenditures, 56% of all the housing expenditures for CPA spent in this region are spent in two communities. You know what they are? Amherst and Northampton. We're doing a good job. And that enables us to be selective about the projects we endorse. In order to spend more CPA dollars, I expect the project to fit the neighborhood. I'd hope that the project where there would be children would require, no, I would hope you would demand that that project have some outdoor play space for children. We have four, five, six, seven, eight-year-olds you'll be sending across Northampton streets to get to Pulaski Park because that's the nearest public park this project has. Or the railroad tracks. That doesn't make sense. This isn't a good plan. When I think in terms of a physical site and I think of a quality affordable housing, what comes to my mind is Treehouse in East Hampton. I don't know if you've heard of it or know it. 
I'd invite all the counselors to come and visit. I'd be happy to arrange a tour. There's plenty of free parking. There's plenty of open space and blue sky, community rooms, computer rooms, libraries, and there's 46 acres of view of, the, of Montan. There'll be another funding. Now, those who would argue that, well, you know, this may not be the best project, but it's still good, and I don't want to lose the funding, the outside funding, I would say to you that uh, there'll be another funding round in 8 to 12 months. And you can have quality, affordable housing. I think this, uh, if you're going to have build new residential units, you have to make sure that there are adequate provisions for parking, because the old residential neighborhoods that had butt this area now live with the downtown parking problem. Uh, Holly Street. I'm sorry, Councilor. You, could, you, could I you, just your time? You can finish up. Yeah. Yeah. Holly Street, Phillips Place, Eastern Avenue look like parking lots. When we go home at night. And I imagine, you imagine your, your area is going home and pulling, noticing there's, there's, there's parking all over your streets. You pull into your own driveway, but you can't pull in because somebody's parking in your space because there's no place to park on the street. That's the reality on Hawley Street. There has to be adequate provisions. If you look at... That's right. I've given you almost a minute extra. And Compare Randolph Place to this project. 75 parking spaces for 42 units. In this project, there's 55 units. You have 99 parking spaces. It calls for 41. You're creating more problems for the city and the neighbors. Thank you very much. Uh, Barry Roth, please. Uh, my name is Barry Roth. I live at 88 Acre Brook Drive in Florence. Um, I'm um, for affordable housing. I think it's interesting that Northampton has more subsidized housing than just about any community in the state of Massachusetts, and yet we're saying that we don't have any affordable housing. So right away that, that raises some questions, or it should. I've seen figures that were used to calculate the need for the um, subsidized housing, and they're bogus. Uh, the mayor has said that this will turn in $100,000 in tax revenue. I have done the research, and it simply isn't true. I've seen Mr. Dial's letter. I heard him speak. I'm sorry, but uh, according to him, if you increment by 30 students at a time, this city will be uh, floating in gold because of all the money that it will bring in. It just doesn't work that way. So I'm not here because I oppose this housing per se. Like I say, I'm all for affordable housing. But my issue is the numbers that it's based on are totally false. No, people should have uh, done an investigation. And most importantly, it comes down to the use of the money in the CPA. I'm basically an environmentalist. environmentalist. I see this as ultimately leading to the destruction of the open space in the community for this reason. If you're going to build a, a, a subsidized housing with CPA money, that unit should be self-sustaining going forward. If you use the CPA money to build a building that is going to require several hundred thousand dollars a year in support, then you are effectively skewing the CPA money to that project. Therefore, I say I would support this. I'm indifferent to the project, whether it goes forward or not. I, but basically, I don't. I, there's a bigger principle at hand here. That is the use of CPA money. I see taking, if you use the money for a park, the park is open to everyone. If you use it for open space, the op space is open to everyone. You can always cut off the funding for those things if, if it becomes a tax problem. Here you are committing the city to, th uh, to several hundred thousand, unless you, you accept Mr. Dial's uh, uh, figures, but uh, everything I've, I've researched says this, this, this is simply not true. So. The reality is what you are doing is you are, if the CPA wants to agree to commit $300,000 a year to this project going forward, I wouldn't be opposed to it. I mean, but let's have it up front and make a decision on the facts. Thanks. Thank you very much. Kelsey Flynn, please. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Kelsey Flynn, 15 Edwards Square, and just thank you for your time and your dedication as counselors. It really means a lot to all of us. I have made Northampton my home since 1989, and in all that time, I've always lived walking distance to downtown, and I just think it's fantastic to be able to do that. Um, earlier, the places I could afford weren't awesome. There was, uh, I, I lived in a place where the wall didn't meet the floor in any of the rooms, so there was this gully that ran around the perimeter of all the rooms, and when it rained, they would become moats, and that was fine, because we were 22, 23, and all we did was drink wine and play Uno, and that worked. <laughs> but now um, I'm married, and my wife and I have two beautiful children, three years old and five months old, and that wouldn't work for us. That's not safe, that's not warm, wouldn't make us happy um, and we still live walking distance from downtown and we live in a home that oh my goodness we're so grateful and, and blessed and honestly just lucky to have because that's kind of what it comes down to is luck and it shouldn't uh, and <coughs> this house makes us really happy and it makes my my kids happy but they're three years old and five months old so a frozen banana and some Cheerios make them happy too um, but I'm hoping in the future it'll make them happy and it'll make them feel good about themselves. And so when they go into school, that's what they can focus on is school and, and what they're learning and their friends and not be distracted by not having a place that makes them feel happy. So I want to keep believing in Northampton as the community that wants all families who want to be here to live here and feel safe and feel happy because we have the affordable housing to do so. I think this is the right project. I think this is the right partner. And it's the right location. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Manto. Good evening. My name is Daniel Manto. I live at 351 Pleasant Street. And um, first of all, I'd like to say 100,000 uh, dittos for what I've heard tonight. Um, and also, I'd like to be considered, uh, I guess, an imbi. I'd like this <laughs> in my backyard. I'd like it in my front yard, actually. I walk up and down Pleasant Street and into downtown um, on a daily basis. And um, looking at the lumber yard now, I envision a space that is more representative of the city that I moved back to after nine years because I finally felt financially secure enough to make Northampton my home again. And also, being a uh, public school teacher in a city, in the city of Springfield, I know on a daily basis what it's like to see families move quickly into a homeless situation. And what that does to um, the children in all sorts of different ways that I have face to face in front of me every day. Um, whether it's suddenly um, a new behavior problem in the classroom because of the situation or um, older sisters that now are feeling a parental role because of the um, fear in their younger siblings and how that not only affects the school community but the surrounding community of the school and the city as a whole and I moved back to Northampton because I believed that this was a project that would make not only the neighborhood that I recently moved back into better, but it would make every facet of the city a better place to live in. And I look forward to that happening. So thank you. Thank you very much. Jim Nash, please. Hello, my name is Jim Nash and I live at 18 Montview Avenue. I have two topics to speak to you about. First, I wholeheartedly support city councilors receiving adequate compensation for tending to their duties. I also believe that any increase in compensation re should reflect the increase in responsibility that was bestowed upon you by the new charter. Under the, new ch under the old charter, we had a strong mayor. City, city council's role was to review and hold the mayor accountable. Under the new charter, city councilors are now the decision makers, and with this comes increased responsibility and time commitment. I believe this needs to be part of your deliberations. 
Um, secondly, I would like to speak to the Lumberyard Project. Um, in recent years, our school committee has had serious discussions around the possibility of closing an elementary school due to decreasing enrollment. Were we to close an elementary school, the impact on, our surrounding, on the surrounding neighborhood would be de devastating. Our schools do more than educate kids. They serve as community centers for recreation, clubs, public dialogue. They are where we vote. So how do we get more kids to keep schools open? Well, it goes without saying that people in their 20s and 30s bear children, and it is this segment of our population that struggles mightily with finding housing in Northampton. A sure way to counter our downward trend in enrollment is by increasing affordable rental housing. Rental units in Northampton are at an all-time low. While we have seen new housing in recent years, the new construction has overwhelmingly featured single-family homes in condominiums. There are fewer and fewer opportunities for folks who, due to age and career, are only able to muster first and last month's rent. Renting rather than owning is, a, is typical for people in their 20s and 30s. My wife and I did not own a house until we were in our mid-30s. Dora, Dora and I had our first child as renters, as did Dora's parents and my parents. Renting and beginning families is a Lewis Nash family tradition. Raising my children, um, raising my children has been the single most enriching experience in my life, and it, it has been a complete blessing to have the opportunity to raise my children here in Northampton. I cannot think of a better way to spend CPC money than providing homes for young families to have the same opportunity. Thank you for considering my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, Roy C. Martin. Ah, money. <laughs> Somebody dropped a quarter. Okay, my name is Roy C. Martin, 81 Con Street, Northampton, Mass. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of City Council, ladies and gentlemen in the audience. First thing, I'd like to take one second here, right, you know, and I'd like to honor Claire Higgins, who is uh, our ex-mayor, and, uh, you know, she was an honorable mayor, and, and she served a lot. And she'll probably speak different than I will about the CPA money. Now, when you're talking CPA money, when you're talking affordable housing, I don't know how you figure in affordable housing as far as the compound goes. Uh, you're talking about children now, right? And uh, most affordable housings that I know, unless it's apartment complexes, uh, uh, don't have any, uh, any children in them. Uh, where I live down there at 81 Constitute, there's no children. Uh, <coughs> You know, you got adults in there. Now you're talking about artists and everything. Now most artists don't have a bunch of children. Huh? You have, you have, if you have children, you have a place somewhere, right? Like up in Meadowbrook or one of the different complexes that has apartments where you can have children. Uh, you know, there's nothing down there. And like one person said, the railroad tracks, right? And CPA money, right? You know. And, uh, and anyways, how do you figure the criteria for affordable housing? I make $4,000 a year for Social Security, all right, you know? I don't know how you figure it because it took me 10 years to get into affordable housing. And then, right, that was only by the luck that uh, Claire Higgins wrote me a nice letter, uh, recommended me for housing, and John Height gave me an apartment. So, <laughs> uh, but... No, I no, I can't speak for that complex down there. Right? It's too big, it's too large, right? You're gonna overshadow the whole part of the city down there. Uh, you got one hotel over here that's built way up in the air. Right? Uh, you're gonna be looking like New York City. Right? When when you go down through the city city streets in New York City, right, kids look up in the air like that and they look at them tall buildings and they get scared. Uh, uh, I lived there, right? I had my family there. I, I didn't like having my family in New York City. We moved to upstate New York. All right, so, uh, you know, right? You just have to uh, hope, right? You know, 
And like I said, all right, you know, uh, you people, you got you got something you got to do. Uh, matter of fact, the majority of you make more than I make in a year, all right. So, all right, do your best, all right. Come out with some kind of vote, but uh, hopefully you vote against this using CPA money for that. You know, all right, use the CPA for something like. 81 Con Street, right, to put new rugs in, something like that. <laughs> Anyways, okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and, uh, uh, you know, I think, uh, right, we should honor Claire with a few minutes of our time. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, um... <laughs> That's all we have signed up for. Uh, is there anyone else interested in speaking on this or any topic? Uh, oh, uh, Mary Higgins, and then Kitty, and then Jeff. Okay. I wasn't sure I was going to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not sure. I'm having a little PTSD, but I am going to speak. Um, I'm Claire Higgins. I live at 106 Laurel Park. And I just want to urge you to support this project. And I don't, everything that needs to be said has been said. I just want to say a couple things. As the director of community action, we're an employer. And it's becoming harder and harder for us to find places for people to live in our communities that we work in at the wages that the federal and state government are willing to give us to pay our child care teachers and our family advocates and all the other folks that do the work for us. We have a turnover approaching 40% in some of our sites in our classrooms. And you can just imagine the effect that that has on children birth to five. So that's an issue for me. And we need more housing that's affordable for those, for those working people. We're talking <coughs> about people who are working and doing really important work. When I moved to Northampton in 1977 and got a job for $3.53 as a child care worker, I was actually able to find some place to live. That's not true today. And so that's where we see the turnover. Secondly, I want to talk about those kids that are living in that housing, who will be living in that housing. What we know about kids and achievement is that stability is critical for children to be able to, to learn and grow. Children who are living in low-income families often have much less stable housing environments than children who are living in more middle-class families. That affects their school achievement, really, for a long, long time. And to the extent that we can help stabilize children's lives so that they can uh, complete school, complete the things that they need to do to be responsible and, and uh, contributing adults, we should be doing that. And I'll say, even if we only do it for the selfish reason that someday we're going to be in a nursing home and we want that person who's measuring our medicine to know how to do math, it's a good enough reason. You know, we, we have, there's some enlightened self-interest in us worrying about the next generation. And finally, family, cities and towns with, without young families die. They wither up. They become tourist attractions. They don't become places where people feed the next generation. And Northampton has to think about how to keep, to attract and keep young families here for the duration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kitty? Um, good evening. My name is Kitty Callaghan, and I live in Ward 7. And I'm going to be very brief. I, I agree with so much that has been said tonight, but I just wanted to respond to one point about the fact that we, we meet a certain threshold, the 10 percent threshold. We, bar we barely meet it. It's only 12 percent. And I think based on what you've heard tonight from virtually almost everyone who has spoken, that there is a crisis in, in affordable housing. There is a real shortage. There are a number of people that cannot, that that work here who cannot afford to, to, to live here. Um, families cannot afford to live here unless they are very have very high incomes. Um, and I urge you to support this project. Thank you very much. Jeff? Jeff Massimino, 34 Fort Hill Terrace. Um, I'd like to speak about the Limbyard Project, and I'd like to speak about one part of it that I haven't heard too many talk about, and that's the historical aspect of it. I studied the property going back to 1873, and I also met I'm friends with Amy Royale. And the two buildings in question, they stand next to each other. This is Amy's building. This is the building the CDC wants to take down. They've been together for over 130 years. My problem is that 
and I know they've done studies on this. I'm not, I haven't really read them all. I'm kind of just speaking off the cuff here, and I'm a little nervous. And, you know, the problem I think that will happen is if you take this building down, this building's still standing. And I haven't done the structural calculations or anything like that, but you're probably going to cause some damage. From what I understand, Amy has offered a, pr a proposal where she, um, she owns the Break King building, which is right next to the two buildings, and she's offered to swap the CDC, that property, for the L building that basically holds up her building right now. And I would just encourage the CDC to kind of consider that a little more before you go through this. I'm all for affordable housing. I'm broke. <laughs> I think everyone in this room is all for more affordable housing. I think it's a great idea. Just consider a few more things first before you go through with it. That's all. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else interested in speaking at this point? Deva? Hi there. Devin Bruce, um, 46 Columbus Avenue. Um, I want to up the bar and say what I really want is a unanimous vote from the from the council. Um, I'm a member of the CPC that's recommended it to you and a member of planning board that's considered changes to the design. Both of those bodies voted unanimously and we worked out a lot of details to get that done. And I think it's important for you to communicate that the community is behind this project. And the CPC funds are, they're a small amount. They are in the scope of the whole project, very little. But what I want that to do is go forward and leverage state housing money and bring that to our town. And so I think uh, from, from the CPC's point of view, I feel good about it. And from the planning board's point of view, I feel good about it. I, I could see projects less desirable than this coming into that spot and meet the zoning I would I would and site plan approval would have to be granted it's not a matter of I don't like that project so I think I think we're in a good position with this it's you you've heard a lot of community support um, we heard both pro and con during the last few months um, I'm I'm one of Tony's thousand hours that have been put in on this so I urge you all to vote for it thank you thank you very much uh, Mayor Ford Okay, well, I'm not going to go up into the millions of dittos, but uh, I will try to avoid repeating. My name is Mary Ford, and I live at 6 Massasoit Street, and um, I want to provide, I guess, a little bit of a long view, um, a little bit of history. From my point of view, uh, my husband and I came to the city in 73. And I remember at the time, in fact, noticing that there were families living around Pleasant Street. Uh, I've seen fewer families there as the decades have gone on. Um, the reality is that there had been so many families. We had an elementary school, William Street School. I don't know how many people remember that. That was already closed down. Maybe 25, 30 years ago was when Dave Musini was mayor. So um, the fact is what's left over time, as some people have mentioned, there are fewer and fewer rentals as opposed to home ownership uh, units in the city. They used to be about 50-50 <coughs> when you go, go back 30, 40 years. Um, with condo uh, creation taking away some of the rental units and with the costs of renting going up, we see more and more people, you all know people in this situation, young people who work in our restaurants and retail, and they will move two or three into an apartment unit that used to belong to a family. So as far as I can see, there is a need for rental family housing. Whatever the income level is, when we build new um, suburban type houses with four bedrooms, those kids add to the cost to educate them also. That's part of what a community does, but we need balance. The total numbers of kids have not been going up. In fact, they've been going down. I want to just say the CPA was passed by the state as an option for towns 
for three specific purposes. During the time of rapid development, the CPA was supposed to allow us to preserve open space, historic buildings, and affordable housing proportionate to what we want in our communi communities to balance off developers building higher end housing. And so that, it seems to me, is why the CPA group and this group um, should stand behind this purpose. It is absolutely within the reason the CPA was uh, given to us as an option. Okay? Thank so you. I am in support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, Ann, I think Jasper, did you have your hand up too? No, okay. Yeah. You go ahead. Yes. You, uh, who, wa who wants to go next? Come on up. Good evening. Um, my name is Claire Hetlinger. I live in Ward 6. Um, I can't afford to live in central Northampton either, although I can afford to manage the transportation difference. Um, it's not that this project is wrong. I fully support um, affordable housing. It's too big, and I think that it could be done better if we keep in mind the human beings that are going to be living there, and I think that's what's that's what's missing from this conversation. I know a family, a low-income family that lived downtown, four adults and two children, they live in a one bedroom. Um, the children uh, dropped out of school because they didn't feel comfortable. Northampton continues to be an elite sort of a place and the public schools do not address the needs of the diverse population that they have. And I know this because I've worked as a translator and a, a teacher myself. I have two children with special needs and anyone that has had them has heard from me on a regular basis, begging for them to be um, better served at the schools. And the only reason they wound up getting a good education is because we had the money to give it to them. If we didn't have that money, our children really would have languished in the schools. This is really happening. It's not you know, the issue at hand tonight, but you have to think these are gonna be families. They're going to need, they need a place to play kickball. They're going to need before and after school care. It's very hard to get affordable before and after school care in Northampton. These are human beings. And it is absolutely not unkind to think twice about whether this is the thing to do. It is very, very kind and very loving and very caring that some people are thinking about whether this is really the best thing. If we have too many people in Northampton, we fill in every single square inch of space. It's not going to be a welcoming place for anybody. It's a beautiful city. Yes, I love it here. We all do. We don't have to change it. You know, there's that little space of green grass across the street from Harold's. I don't know if that sign is still there. They don't want people on it because it's the only grass that's growing anywhere in that, in that neighborhood. And this is what these families are going to need. Yeah. There are other places much better suited. You know, the Shaw's Motel, the Northampton Nursing Home, I mean, I don't know about what the deal is with these properties, it's not my job, but the families would be much better suited at places like that. Um, my own daughter needed, um, she needed speech therapy. She, when we had adopted her, she, at three years old, she had a vocabulary of about three or four words. She needed speech therapy and she never got it from the Northampton Public Schools. They couldn't afford it. They couldn't keep a speech therapist long enough to do the job. They just didn't have the resources. So I really would like to keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else? Jasper. Hi, my name is Jasper Lapiensky. I live at Village Hill uh, temporarily. So First, a note about sustainability. This is the final page of the agenda. Um, I feel that it could have been condensed by two lines. I love uh, your email address and your phone number, but in the future, just sort of think about the resources that we're using for financial and ecological terms. Um, second note about sustainability. I 
am uh, a representative of several things that have been spoken about in the hypothetical. Uh, a member of the next generation, uh, someone who has been periodically underemployed in the last couple of years, and someone who is still desperately struggling to find a place to rent, which I really have not found for more than a few months in the last year. Um, that said, uh, what my generation and what low-income people need, you've all basically missed the point because the only person who spoke about parking said there should be more of it. Affordable housing should be limited only to people who don't have cars because driving and pollution and global warming is the enemy. We can build as many units of affordable housing as we need. Hurricane Sandy will knock them down. The Sandys don't discriminate on the basis of race, on the basis of income. It's gone. And I don't think that is likely to happen in Northampton, but it's likely to happen somewhere, and it might be because we're encouraging pollution in places like Northampton. Um, so it's worth considering that uh, Mr. Kaczynski's remarks were utterly ridiculous. Uh, but I'm not going to pretend that my generation is really the focus of this. I think the focus of this has been generally good. Um, it has been somewhat lacking. And the point I really wanted to make is that once we build affordable housing, we're going to have people in downtown. Yes, you're close to all the resources, um, but most of the homeowners and business owners in Northampton don't shovel the sidewalks. Most of them don't clip their hedges. There's no way to walk around town or, or really bike around town except for on a few roads for four or five months of the year. Uh, and even if you do have a car, right, that, that comes into play. We're not good at maintaining an environment for the people that we want to bring in. Um, and I, I would include myself in that. Um, are we serious about it? Are we willing to actually do something? Um, the Academy of Music bus stop has this much snow in it. The bus stop across the street where there's no space, the bench has this much snow under it and it had this much snow on top of it until I cleared it off <coughs> so I could put a bag down without it getting wet and rotting through. Um, we have plenty of money, I think, to do that. And I know that my time is up this is just going to connect the dots here. We have two things on the agenda besides that, one of which is snow and ice removal, and the other is vibrant sidewalks, and there is no communication there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ruthie. I'm Ruthie Woodring, 8i Street, Florence. I just want to say what a pleasure it was to be able to ride down the path to get to a city meeting, to come somewhere, like mm -hmm. have a canopy of trees over you mm -hmm. and the full moon coming across the snow. And I'm super grateful for that and that the city has this resource that they keep maintained for the public to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Laila Hussein. I live at 34 Michaelman Avenue, one of CDC affordable apartments. I've been there for almost 12 years. Uh, the building where I live in, there is 10 apartments, at least six of them been living there as long as I'm there. It's a very nice place. Uh, we do need more affordable housing in Northampton. A lot of people talk about a lot of stuff, domestic violence, a lot of other things that really make this a good place for people and we do need more affordable housing. That's important. Thank you, Lila. Anyone else? Andrew. Hi, I'm MJ Adams. I live in uh, the Bay State section of town. I grew up here and I moved back here to raise my family and I was very lucky to be able to do that. And I'm here tonight because I'm really sp speaking in support of the project that the Valley CDC is uh, planning down at the lumber yard. I had the opportunity to serve as the executive director of Habitat for Humanity here in the area for 11 years. And what I saw there was a number of families who wanted to make Northampton home, who tried to make Northampton home, but it was really difficult for them to do it. They wanted to be homeowners, but many of them weren't able to step into home ownership, but really wanted to live here. I think there's a very profound and deep need for this housing, and I really hope that you give it your full consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, we will now uh, move into the regular meeting, and I'll ask the clerk to call the minutes. Here. Present. Here. Present. Present. Here. 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 Uh, we have a quorum, and we are convened. Um, we, first up, we have uh, scheduled, and actually, I'll, I'll preface this with folks who are sitting around waiting. We're going to move this item up to the top of the agenda, so if you want, to, so you don't have to sit and wait forever for us to discuss it. But before that, we have a scheduled public hearing that was scheduled. Uh, for 7.05, for just a tick late. <coughs> um, this is for a national grid poll petition for uh, uh, for Burncott Avenue. Lisa, the proponent. Mm -hmm. I'll move uh, to open the public hearing. Thank you. Second. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Good All evening, Lisa. Lisa. Aye. Aye. Oh, sorry. Aye. 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 There you go. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. Lisa Jasinski with National Grid. We're looking for permission to place a poll in the public way at the northern side of the lot for house number 237 on Spring Grove Avenue. It's, uh, it sits in the corner of Spring Grove and Burn Colt, so the, the poll will actually sit on Burn Colt Road. Right now we have, um, we're, they're changing the service to the house and the, and the wire's coming right over the roof of it. So we're just trying to correct that situation. And then really the best way to do it is to set this poll. Any questions? Are there any opponents? Petition? Uh, accept the motion to close the hearing. So moved. Close the hearing. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Move to grant the permit. Second it. Motion is made to grant the permit and second it. All those in favor, please say Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much Thank for you your very patience, much. Lisa. I appreciate it. Um, we do have a resolution that's scheduled. It's actually somewhat coincidental but appropriate to the issue that most of you are sitting here waiting for. But I would beg the council's indulgence that and ask us to consider the uh, the CPC grant yes. first. Is that okay? Yes. The, the thing that we're bumping down is the vibrant sidewalk resolution. Mm -hmm. For those of you who want to stick around for that, because a lot of the topics that we touched on uh, coincide. So we will do that, and I will accept the motion to put on the floor the financial order for the Valley CDT Lumber Yard Project. So moved. Second. second. Um, I need to recuse myself from this discussion, so I'm going to take leave for a moment. No. Okay. So, it is on the floor. Council Labart. Thank you. Um, before I start to talk about the project of the former lumber yard, I would like to state that I noticed a name in the Gazette on February 3rd of 2015, a Gail Labarge, owner of the lumber company, and was being sued, and the lumber company, and was being sued. Her husband, Richard, is a third or fourth distant cousin to my husband, Richard. I talked to our city solicitor, Alan Seawall, and he had stated this is not a conflict of interest. And it will also not interfere with the way I decide to vote. Um, oh. oh, you're still talking. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I got a little bit sorry. of talking. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting uh, I'm sorry. Continue. As a city councilor, I have gone way above my job on the project of Valley CDC. But I had to make sure all my questions were answered and the right ones given to me of concerns from residents in Ward 6 and on Pleasant Street. I had spent a good five weeks on this project. I saw the plans for the first time on December 29th, and I was also concerned about the size of the project. Pictures can be deceiving of a design. HAP's project is going to be five stories high with 72 units, and Valley CDC is four stories with 55 units. I am surprised, as a counselor, I had not received any complaints on that project. 
I had made several site visits on my own looking at the area. I received an invitation from a butter Mary Fenn to come on her property and hear her concerns of the project. Look at the site from the second floor, her window. I told Mary Finn that looking at the site, which is 1.2 acres, the building coverage of the total parcel represents about 32% of that area. This is just building footprint. The building footprint is just about 18,000 square feet on that 1.2 acres. The rest of the site is plaza area, landscaping, and playground. And I did have concerns about the size of the playground. Hopefully, which I had talked with Joanne Campbell about them enlarging that playground because I really do have concerns as a city councilor of a good quality of life for those children, whoever, who lives at that site. Anyways, the rest of the site is plaza area, landscaping, and playground. I saw not a problem for this building to be constructed on that site. I have to say, as an abutter, Mary Finn was very respectful and wonderful to work with. Mary gave me a letter from her abutters who own Royal. I did read those concerns. I feel, as a city councilor, <clears throat> there is some misperception of not wanting affordable housing by the abutters. And I have not heard that perception. I have been hearing from those abutters that they do and always would support affordable housing. It is the process, I think, that there is concerns about. And here are my findings from the concerns of residents on my ward and also from some of the abutters. Interfere with a budding property owned by Royal. The current condition has two buildings that are connected to Royal property. Proposed development would recreate, I mean, would create a 14 foot by 40 foot gap between the new building and the Royal buildings. It creates options for Royal to add new windows for openings for more light into their buildings. Breaking has and will still have three non-conforming wide driveway cuts on Pleasant Street. And I did hear something to the effect tonight from one of our residents talking about Royal and about the historical preservation of a building. Also, um, Mary Finn and I had looked at the plans together and the color of the building. There's no city regulations that require a certain color of a building, but I had to agree with her and back on the second floor of her window and seeing part brick and the rest of just really very bright white. I had to agree with her that there needed to be a change of color. I called Joanne Campbell, talked with her about it. She was going to talk with the contractors and I'm hoping that there is communication with Mary Fenn on her concerns of the color and the abutters. The design of the building, Central Business Architect Commission asked for and the applicant change the building design and the order for the committee to find that the project met the standards and the guidelines. Four out of four CBAC members found the project meets all the guidelines. It includes finding that the new theme building is consistent with downtown, downtown theme buildings. The applicant changed window sills, lintels, window patterns to address the concerns. The building height, the scale, the massing is consistent with downtown buildings. Preservation of historical building, the historical building. There is no standalone historic building. The lumberyard owners altered and added on to the origin, original building located on the site. The standard in the CBAC guidelines only applies to standalone historical buildings, not buildings that have pieces of old buildings. The remains of the original brick building are not usable for Valley CDBC. Matching context of the neighborhood, there are many non-conforming one-story buildings on Pleasant Street. 
from where there were, were more auto, uh, auto focus uses on these lots. City plans call for providing new space for commercial and mixed use buildings on Pleasant Street and King Street with 70 foot heights. Infill and wetlands, this site is 100% paved. After construction, 21% 20, green space will be added, and I'm hoping as a city councilor again that we add more green space for the children to have a very, very decent playground in that site. The proposed build out would result in 79% paved and or building surfaces and 21% green space. Placing needing housing on a pre-developed site steers development away from the wetlands and the wooded areas. The financial impact to the city, CP dollars are not used as a down payment. If the project is not built, the CPC money is not given. It will be used on another project. CPC will contribute 5,500 per unit, total $300,000 to create these units. This is lowest per unit CPA dollar cost to date. Previous combined, combined CPA awards, 29,358 <clears throat> per unit cost. The local data show downtown multifamily contain one-tenth of 1% 1 of school age children. Florence and outlying subdivisions have double that number of school age children. CPA money must be used on affordable housing, open space, recreation, and historic preservation, nothing else. The city residents had voted two times in favor of CPA, which shows support to be spent on these projects. More com commercial space exceeds zoning requirements. We'll have 3,100 square feet on Pleasant Street, about the size of Sylvester's. Yes, about the size of Sylvester's. is more than the current lumberyard retail space. I also would like to continue on on this, that if Valley CDC's project does not plan out, there will likely be another multifamily housing project that locates this site. And I think we really need to look at that very carefully. This could contain many more units than what is currently proposed based on our zoning in the commercial district. It could be all market rate or any combination of affordable and market rate because the zoning allows for the density and flexibility. I want to thank Carolyn Mish, our senior land use planner, for spending time with me and my residents to help them with their concerns and answers given to them. I also spent a little time with Carolyn Mish a week ago for almost just about an hour and 45 minutes explaining to me all the concerns I have gotten from many residents throughout my ward and in the city. I also want to thank Wayne Biden, our Director of Planning, who was very helpful working with me and my residents. We desperately need more places for ordinary working people to live in our town. As a city councilor for 17 years, I have always supported affordable housing, always. This was one of the hardest projects for me in 17 years and doing research for five weeks. The project will be a welcome place to people of lower incomes in Northampton. We can not only be a community for the wealthiest, affordable housing does benefit everybody. It benefits the tax base, it benefits the business community by making it possible for people to work and to live here. I want to thank Bill Delha for his response on educating our children in our city. I thank him very, very much. I want to thank our superintendent of our schools, John Provost, for his excellent article about our work in the Northampton schools. CPA funding application has not, nothing to do with educating a child. No matter where our child lives in this city, it is our responsibility to educate our children all of our children. They are indeed our future, no matter the circumstances of their birth 
or economic situation. I just hope all involved in the project will reach a compromise that balances neighbors' concerns and the city's needs for affordable housing. And I want to thank everybody tonight for being here and coming up and talking about affordable housing and the needs of it in our city. And I am supporting this project 100%. I have done my research for five weeks, which was very valuable to me, and to talk to the mother, who also I found as extremely as respectful as could be and understanding. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to explain the disposition of the vote uh, in the context of a lawsuit. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows there is a lawsuit that's been filed um, against the city and, and against the planning board and against um, uh, the property owner. Uh, and uh, we, uh, I asked the solicitor to render an opinion about how that would affect and impact the disposition of the vote, and you're all in receipt of that, but for the public, it will have, it has no bearing on this decision. Um, and also, I want to reiterate what Council LaBarge had just mentioned, that the granting of this, should this occur and pass and succeed tonight, this award, uh, is that money reverts back to the CPA provide, if, if the project does not meet the criteria and does not succeed. It is not that this money is suddenly broadcast and sent out and disappeared forever and ever. We get it back. So that said, Councilor Carney. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I, I want to say that much of what what I have to say tonight, I said at our meeting three weeks ago, and um, not a lot has, has really changed in those last few weeks. But I guess the most important thing for me to say is that um, this has been a very difficult um, decision-making process for me. I'm one of those probably on the council who's been most zealous in the form of uh, supporting workforce housing, affordable housing, low-income housing. I served on the Northampton Housing Partnership. I served on the Northampton Housing Authority. Um, and had I not gotten the ear of a couple of constituents of mine during this process, uh, early on when we first uh, started voting, I would probably have been making much of the same speeches that my colleagues were making in the last, uh, at the last meeting. In fact, I do not disagree with anything that I've heard from any of my fellow counselors, and I, I do not disagree with probably most of what I heard from public comment this evening. I am fully in support of affordable housing at the Lumberyard location. I want to see it there. And frankly, I know it will go there because of what I've heard from, unless everybody's changed their votes, I know that the votes are here tonight to pass CPA funding. At least that, that hurdle will be passed. Um, I am also, I, I don't like to disappoint those who've asked for a unanimous vote, but there are reasons that I I'm, remain um, uh, hesitant to support fully at this point. Again, I said that um, I listened at length to constituents uh, Mary Beth Erb and Mary Finn regarding this and com heard their frustration entirely why um, their heads may have been spitting come October 30th when they received notice of um, the first public hearing to happen in two weeks. I say this with the full <coughs> understanding that CPC completely met all of its uh, all of its obligations to notify, in my understanding, and and I'm fully in agreement with the Valley CDC's mission to provide uh, affordable housing, and want to thank uh, Joanne Campbell for all the work and all that's been done to set this up over the course of I understand at least 15 months. Um, I think that if there had been, I think if folks who were direct abutters were a little bit more involved 15 months ago, we may be saying a few different things that, that we would be at a different point right now. So um, that being said, uh, my conversations with Mary Beth Erb and Mary Finn also revolved around the fact that they were enormously pained by the fact that they were painted as anti-affordable housing no matter how much they said that that's not what, the, that they were opposed to the structure 
to the building or they had issues with material design, materials, design, size, mass, but also just many, many questions that weren't answered or not, at least not answered to their satisfaction. So I guess my sense was um, I do have the luxury of knowing that this will pass in order to be able to state an objection that's more representative of the fact that there is not unanimity around this. I understand there was a unanimous vote of the CPC and of the planning board, and I understand that there's a municipal appeal that's before the, the planning board asking them to reconsider and look at those guidelines that say very clearly that development projects shall not overwhelm their neighbors, shall be harmonious in size and scale. So we all say, but wait a minute, these are all pre-existing non-conforming uses. These are all anomaly properties. <laughs> Isn't that strange, though, that all of the buildings surrounding there would be anomaly properties? It presents a dilemma. And I think one that really requires more scrutiny. It, it will have to, the scrutiny will have to happen given the fact that we have a process on the books that allows for, allows for a person to appeal the decision. And I'm waiting now to hear what the appeal process will bring, what that scrutiny will bring. My hope is what it will bring is a better project, one that the, um, the constituents that I'm voicing here uh, would like to see in terms of uh, uh, um, a little bit more space for those folks who are living there to be able to have recreation, but also an aesthetic quality that they will have to live with for the rest of eternity or as long as they are that there. They, these are people who have spent the last 20 years investing in this part of town, and I would hope that they would have a little bit more. One more thing is that I'm, I'm really saddened that the objections that they've, I, I mean, I'm, we're used to this in public office. I mean, when I make a vote, I know that this can mean that people will hold this vote, will hold me to my vote, and decide whether or not they want to elect me next time based on that. What I can say is that please don't consider this as a vote against affordable housing. It certainly is not. I would like to see a better CPC, a C, CPA funded project, one that would get better buy-in from the abutters, and I think it could. It saddens me that in the social media, just eight hours ago, we are having calls from people in the community. I just called Optical Studio to say I won't be a customer anymore due to their opposition. Other people saying, right on. NIMBY. These are conversation stoppers, and it's really sad that we can't have open discussion in this community without the repercussions of a boycott. So I would ask people in the community to please uh, here, take them at their word, as Judge Perlman has said, that these are people who have expressed a commitment to affordable housing. This is a biracial family that lives a stone's throw from the largest affordable housing <laughs> complex in the city right now. And to reduce their objections to mere nimbyism and anti-affordable housing, which is euphemistic in many ways, <coughs> is really unfortunate. So I don't want to end with that. I just want to say that I feel hopeful. I feel hopeful that there is a process. I know that we will fund this project tonight. And I hope that there will be more dialogue as, as the planning board continues to review the appeal and as other things take their course. Councilor Adam. I support this project um, for many of the reasons we heard tonight. Only two things I would like to add is one that is that <clears throat> we're at about 12 possibly slightly above that 12 percent affordable housing in this city um, and and some have said we're you know we're over the limit um, 10 percent is is not goal or ideal 10 percent is a minimum mandatory um, lower than that means that our local zoning zoning could be circumvented by developers um, more than that is in my opinion good and um, and more affordable housing should be a continued goal and I don't think that we have too much. I think we have too little. The other point is that out of our total house affordable housing stock in this city, many, many of those units have a, a limitation on how long they'll be affordable for. And when that expires, they can be at market rate. And when that happens, 
those people who live there now will not be living there in the future and they won't be living in Northampton realistically. This project doesn't have that limit. This project will be affordable permanently. So when we have that challenge in the future of how to increase our affordable housing stock after those units that are affordable now become market rate, we won't have that problem with this project um, and, and the units in, the, in, that, in this project. And I support this project completely again. Thank you. Councilor Spector. Yeah, I think people spoke very eloquently and covered all the topics in public session. I just want to identify a couple of very specific details. Two people mentioned concern about CPA having to pick up a tab of $300,000 a year or pay to keep this project going. CPA funds cannot be used as operating funds. So just so everybody knows that, that is not what the CPA does. They don't fund, once a project is going and they have put money into it, they cannot use it for operating funds. So that's number one. Number two, this whole thing about the students and more students coming in. Well, just want to talk from my own experience. I grew up what I guess would be called affordable housing. We used to call them housing projects. I grew up in a housing project, and if we weren't there, I was still going to go to school. This was my brother in the same school district. It just would have meant my father would have gotten a third job, and my mother would have gotten a second job. So this whole thing about suddenly you have affordable housing and it's only going to attract people from other communities with families and more kids, which, by the way, I don't oppose anyway, but it's just not a good argument. It's for people also who live here in the community. It's not necessarily additional students. It's just making it easier on the families. So as someone pointed out, they're not paying 55% or 60% of their income on rent. Um, and those are the only two points I want to make, and I will support this project. Anyone else? Um, Councilor Don? I, I, um, <clears throat> I don't want to repeat some of the eloquent comments that have been made um, in the council and especially in public comment tonight, but I would say that as I thought about this, th you know, there's been a lot of talk about um, the money that we're spending as a city to support this project. And I think perhaps um, as we vote on this, it's more useful to think about uh, what we get in return for this money. And I think in 20 years, we'll look back on the $300,000 of CPA money, and I hope we'll be happy we had the wisdom to spend it to receive what I think is actually a very transformative gift for the city. Um, I think the failure to appropriate this money is not just a failure to live up to our principles, as has been stated. I think it's, in a, in a way, a failure of imagination, by which I mean we're failing to imagine what we lose by not doing it. Uh, we're failing to imagine uh, the people who we won't meet, the neighbors we won't have, the opinions we won't hear. Um, and the question in, on my mind is, you know, how much will our community continue to contract and shrink because it can no longer uh, afford uh, to accommodate all the different kinds of people who will contribute to its future. And I know that sounds kind of wishy-washy and, and um, you know, not, and not kind of down to earth and a little poetic, but it's actually something that's very important because people who are going, to, who either live here today and need affordable housing or perhaps could live here but, but can't, uh, can't now, um, will tangibly improve uh, the community in Northampton. And I think, again, for $300,000, that is really a bargain. So I hope we have the wisdom to accept uh, that today. Um, I'd just like to say that, first of all, I'm really grateful for the opportunity that we have had this discussion. Um, we've actually approved lots of CPA grants and awards without any discourse, pretty much. I mean, the presentation's made, we all nod our heads and we agree, this is a good thing. Uh, this actually, this conversation actually points out the importance and relevance of the CPA. And by the way, I, I want to remind people that, as Council LeBarge said, there were two votes. There, the second vote was a, a monumental affirmative vote for CPA and it's the ethos that's packed into it. It was, I think, close to 75% at, at one of our higher turnout elections. 
that is a, a significant community endorsement of the of, for the principles of the CPAs. As you heard, it's a four-legged chair. You have historical preservation, recreation space, uh, affordable housing, and what did I miss? Historic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Historic. Historic. I, okay. The, the fact that we are talking about it and talking about the value and talking about it is a projection of our greatest hopes for ourselves and the way we view ourselves in our most ideal aspect is heartening. And the testimony today was, uh, in public comment, was thoughtful, moving, and it really reaffirmed for me what it is that I value in this community beyond anything else. And it's, it's the genuine commitment to um, uh, the variety and the diversity that we aspire to, to try and achieve that because it informs the integrity of this community. Um, I'm excited about this project for a number of reasons. And one of the things I was a little concerned with is some of the comments about, you know, it's not ideal, it's not the best, it's, it's not a beacon, it's not this or that. I want to, I, I think that really kind of diminishes what a remarkable project this is. I think the discussion of this, this is, this is uh, an energy efficient, more than decent housing. It really is a significant structure. And it's a significant and decent structure. It's not, this is not slapdash. It's not a cinder block facade. This is something that actually has, it will, it will strike the eye. There will be aesthetic conflicts that goes every, that goes with any prospect of any new development. But the fact is this, the project, the thought and decency that this was, uh, that this project was developed and designed with, I think deserves the credit that it hasn't been getting necessarily. That doesn't obviate the fact that there are, uh, 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 obviate the objections and the concerns and the investment of concerns. But I also, at the same time, don't want it to be diminished in anyone's minds thinking that we're settling for something here. We actually have an opportunity here, I think, in my mind. I think we have a unique opportunity that we have not seen in a long, long time. To Councillor Adams' point, the fact is, is that uh, once upon a time, the federal government, back when we were a socialist country, uh, was invested in restoring and establishing affordable housing with funding. But it came with that caveat that he mentioned, which is at some point, if you feel like it, if you meet your obligations and your commitment to our loan to you, that property can flip the market rate. Uh, President Bill Clinton, in his infinite wisdom, decided to make that happen a little quicker. And consequently, Northampton was in jeopardy. The, with the properties now known as Halfway Farms was in prospect of flipping to market rate. Both councilors, uh, uh, both mayors, Ford, and at the time, Councilor Large Higgins, and myself and others were working very hard to make sure that we, kind, we could mitigate that. It was a heroic struggle uh, with modest success, but nowhere near enough. And as Councillor Adams said, this, that's 10% requirement is a minimum. It is, you don't spike the ball when you get a C, you get a passing grade. You do not brag on the fact that we've met the minimum standards that have been established to at least in some bureaucrats' concept of what constitutes a good and decent place to live. We aspire for more. That's what makes us better. The, the ideal is not the structure, but the ideal is the thing that we carry in our hearts, the aspiration to be a good and decent place for everybody. And just imagine for the community in the years coming hence where kids grow up downtown as they grow up and experience life differently than kids who grow up in the outer wards who do have vast open space to play in. Um, my son grew up close to downtown. His, he basically, his play area pretty much consisted of, you know, if we wanted him to play safely, we'd tie his leg to a cinder block and could run in a circle because we didn't want him crossing any streets and we took him to the park. But it was part of the trade-off that we made for living downtown. And he came out okay. He still talks to me, still talks to his mother. I think that's an achievement. I think the, the, the fact is that he also has 
a sense of devotion to this community because he grew up in it as a kid. And, he, and a kid growing up downtown will improve our downtown. That kid may get busted for riding a skateboard at some point, but that kid may also at the same time grow up to be an adult who has a built-in intrinsic sense of value of the community. I obviously support this. I support the notion of this. I'm optimistic that it will pass tonight. I think it will, I would like to say to the further up the funding stream that this has a significant community support. And, I, and that's even with the, uh, the people who stand in opposition. They all support it. Everyone has said and declared the universal support of the notion and the concept of affordability and the value. I want the funders further upstream to recognize that. I want the abutters to know that this is not the end of the process and the ability to influence um, changes. I should also note that the changes are significant compared to the changes, as someone else mentioned, uh, that could be implemented if CPA money was not involved. It w a lot of this stuff would be allowed by right, and there wouldn't be any consultation with the abutters. So uh, again, I'm grateful for everyone who came tonight and spoke on this issue on all sides of it, and I'm grateful for the counselor's uh, contemplation and discussion. So if there, someone wants to slap me around and, and say something back or something, you're welcome to say something. If not, we can move, proceed to the vote. Uh, Council Sharp. I really couldn't be more ready to take this vote, so come on. <laughs> Bam. She's, are you calling the question? <laughs> okay. I am calling the question. She's calling the question. The question is being called for the first reading of uh, the proposed CPC grant award. Councilor Carney. No. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Suspend Rule 14. There's second. been, a <coughs> excuse me, there's been a motion made and seconded to suspend rules to allow for a second reading of this vote. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? I'll accept a motion to put it on the floor. So moved. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Yes. Councilor Barnes. Yes. Councilor Murphy? Oops, sorry. <laughs> Councilor Donald? Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? No. The award passes in second reading and is done. Um, Can you take a break? Thank you. There's been a request for a recess, so we'll go into recess for five minutes, which will actually turn out to be more like eight. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Uh, we're coming out of recess, our five-minute recess that went to 12 minutes, and uh, thank you for rejoining us. Um, now we go back to the top of the agenda. Um, there. The mayor, as I understand, has no communications uh, to share, and there are no uh, proclamations. Okay. Uh -oh. uh, just a quick, just an announcement to the public that might be watching. So, um, people may not know that Saturday is National Eat Ice Cream for Breakfast Day. Yes. Oh, I did not know this. Yeah. Um, and so, I will be uh, I will be serving as a celebrity scooper. At Harold's uh, at nine o'clock on Saturday morning, and it's a benefit that's being sponsored by several local businesses to benefit whole children. Uh, the proceeds will benefit whole children. So, um, if you got a hankering for ice cream on Saturday morning, it's uh, it's not just for dessert anymore. I guess it's for breakfast, you can come on down. So, Councilor Adam, how long does that go for? Um, nine to twelve. Nine to twelve, I think. Yeah. So, uh, and obviously Harold's is open. Um, if you want it for lunch and dinner. Um, so thank you. That was my announcement. <laughs> thank you. Uh, now we come to the resolution for vibrant sidewalks. And this will be the second reading. You'll recall um, the first reading was June 20th, 2013. Uh, the resolution was carried over to the 2014-2015 session uh, on December 19th, 2013. On March 20th, 2014, the resolution was referred to the Committee on Social Services 
veterans culture and recreation and has proceeded from there with some amendments some proposed amendments and recommendations so um, first I'll accept the motion put it on the floor so moved second it okay um, would anyone from the SSV uh, VCR be willing to talk about this uh, council of barge um, the resolution on vibrant sidewalks our committee which included um, Councillor Gina Louise Sierra from Ward 4 and Councillor Alyssa Klein from Ward 7. We worked very, very tirelessly on this resolution. As we heard our Council President Bill DeWhite state about the hearings that we've had and the meetings that were involved, there was two public hearings on the following date, September 15th on a Monday at 5 o'clock to 6.30 p.m. at the Council Chambers. There also was another meeting on an open public hearing on October 14th on Tuesday from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And I'm going to let Alyssa Klein, Counselor from Ward 7, and Gina Luisiera go ahead and speak about what occurred out of these public hearings. Who wants to go first? Well, I can make a general statement. We yeah. can go over some of the comments that were made, but we uh, had these two hearings, one here and one at the Florence Civic Center, because we wanted to make sure that we pulled people from Leeds and Florence as well, and that we also addressed um, downtown Florence, not just downtown Northampton. Um, and we got some really interesting and insightful and thoughtful feedback from the community about what vibrant sidewalks meant to them and we in the revision of the vibrant sidewalks resolution we actually took into account i think every public comment that we heard and we incorporated concepts from all of the comments into the new version so we can go um you know line by line and we can talk about what we heard and why we put it there i don't know if that's useful to the council or not i don't want to yeah i think we should just the changes uh, uh, yeah, I, I think I, I think for purposes of the uh, discussion that I know that Council Carney and myself and Councilor Adams as the sponsors would like to hear the discussion about the amendments. Yeah. Do you, Gina Louise, do you want to do that, or you want me to keep um, going? You can start as I pull it up. Okay. So um, maybe we should read it. I think you want yeah. me to read it? And then, well, maybe you could read it section by section, and we'll explain what uh, the comment was that came into play in that in the particular section okay this is, and now we're going to make sure this is the amended version yeah I, I believe so um this is upon the recommendation of city councilors uh <coughs> huh councilors jesse maureen t carney i'm pretty sure that was <laughs> in, unless you got it <laughs> so we'll have to strike that first jesse for uh city councilors maureen t carney william h dwight and jesse m adams and council mary m labarge thank you the printed version uh, this is a re uh, resolution to support vibrant sidewalks. And whereas <laughs> urban planning professors Anastasia Lukaito uh, Sideris and Rania <laughs> Aaron <laughs> Foyt, yeah, right? Okay, <laughs> identify f that they have a very difficult names. Uh, identify five essential purposes of sidewalks uh, in their co in their compelling article quote uh, vibrant sidewalks in the United States reintegrating walking in a quintessential social realm, close quote. And whereas the, uh, these essential purposes can be described as follows. Movement. Sidewalks facilitate the movement of people from one place to another and should afford us unfettered access to venues and locations, commercial, formal, and informal, that we wish to enter. Encounter. Sidewalks are places where we congregate and meet people, people we know, people we don't know, and people we may not want to know. And sometimes this purpose of sidewalk trumps the, uh, the quote, movement, quote, purpose, as in when a street fair temporarily closes a pathway to normal traffic. Sidewalks are where, quote, spontaneous and planned festivities break the rhythm of everyday life and give collective expression to people's joy, sorrow, or aspirations, close quote. Expression. Free speech, assembly, and expression must be accommodated in public, even if some consider these activities disruptive, uncomfortable, or confrontational. 
discussion, debates, disagreements, protests, rallies, and sit-ins are all forms of expression that take place on democratic sidewalks. Under Article 16 of Part 1 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, it stated that, quote, the right of free speech shall not be abridged, close quote. Survival. For some people, the sidewalk is home and the only place where they can carry in they can carry out ordinary activities of daily life. Sidewalks are also often controversially the places where some people go to earn a living. Beauty. Sidewalks can be a place of lush beauty with trees, plants, street furniture, art, and other items that give the sidewalk and the community it serves its own identity. And whereas a uh, 2011 uh, Nelson Nygaard design charrette focused on downtown Northampton called for sidewalks markedly widened and Main Street narrowed to shorten crosswalks, increased safety, increased public space for foot traffic and in front of all local, in front of local businesses and provide an opportunity for more benches. And whereas in 2005 a study entitled Northampton Streetscape Improvement Plan, Main Street and Pleasant Street was prepared for, uh, by the Denig Design <coughs> Associates Incorporated and called for an addition to improving and widening the sidewalks, increased seating along Main Street and Pleasant Street. And whereas people are more likely to walk in areas that host a diversity of uses, and whereas the sound, of, the sound infrastructure and ongoing upkeep of sidewalks and crosswalks keep them safe for and navigable to all, and whereas the Northampton City Council supports the Northampton and Florence business communities and believes that vibrant democratic sidewalks and public spaces can enhance the experience of visitors and wishes to provide unfettered access to commercial establishments along our sidewalks. And whereas trees enliven the sidewalks, purify the air, control erosion of topsoil, and provide shade and beauty for those traveling, uh, traversing, uh, gathering, and lingering on the sidewalks, and whereas the street furniture allows for a city to be more of a community, an area to gather, share and experience life together, and whereas benches provide pedestrians with an opportunity to sit and rest, wait for a bus where there isn't adequate bus shelter space, meet a friend, or read the paper. Now therefore, be it resolved that the Northampton City Council envisions sidewalks as spaces that can accommodate a variety of activities and calls for the city to honor both the spirit and the language of this resolution by installing or placing additional street sidewalk furniture along the entire length of main streets in downtown Northampton and downtown Florence, as well as along other commercial streets in the city, ensuring access to commercial establishments <coughs> along our sidewalks, ensuring upkeep of sidewalks and crosswalks to allow for uni universal access, encouraging the creation of artwork <coughs> on our sidewalks and increasing the number of shade trees on our downtown and commercial streets throughout the city. Note one, Scribner's error. Uh, just uh, looks like we're missing an and. Mm -hmm. And it is, the and is on page <coughs> two in the third paragraph, whereas in 2005, at the end of that paragraph, at the end of the semicolon, there should be an and. So it should read <coughs> along Main Street and Pleasant Street semicolon and, and yes. whereas. Just Got to it. be consistent. To, to transition to the next whereas. Got it. Noted. <coughs> uh, Councilor Sherrod, Councilor Klein. Um, so did, did you say that you'd like to go through section by section and talk about what has changed from the original? Is that, is that what you said? Well, I, I think actually just a general discussion about, now, uh, to frame it, the reason this resolution is so long in coming after its initial um, introduction was there was a lot of con controversy focusing on the language and what people projected as to what it implied and what it did and didn't do. And uh, there were uh, <coughs> here on the council floor, was out in the public in general, I think the, the newspaper editorialized about it as well. and. Um, we, that the sponsors felt that the, the value of this resolution, as the case with most resolutions, is the promotion of the discussion. So, insofar as that, it was the you guys presided over the forum that the discussion was held, which was great. And uh, the one I participated in, what I thought was excellent, I think we got a lot of 
of sense of what it was. It was very similar to what some of the public comment that we heard tonight. But that was the real strength of this resolution was to have people discuss with a focus on what it means to have this public space. And you guys, I know, and in, in working with Councilor Council. Adams as well, worked really hard to try to figure out what's the best way to transmit the spirit of what we were saying without omitting what what some people asked us to omit, which was, so how did you, how did you guys artfully pull this off? Well, I think a lot of what we heard, I mean, in addition to sort of expressing the rights that people have on, on um, a lot of what we heard is that what makes a vibrant sidewalk or downtown is that it's a pleasant place where people want to congregate and that the features that create that um, are are trees and benches, but benches for the importance for uh, for people who are disabled and need that that space to rest, and um, and that they are our infrastructure is kept up so that they people can um, traverse them safely. Um, and so we tried to incorporate a lot of that. Into, so in, in addition to sort of the original language, we um, I think that's a lot of what you see here. I think another really important point is that we heard from members of the business community that they support vibrant <coughs> sidewalks and they supported the language that uh, was in the original uh, resolution, but that they were concerned that it wasn't balanced enough in the sense that it didn't actually address some of the issues that come out of uh, vibrancy and that sometimes businesses get, the entrances get blocked or people don't feel comfortable going uh, into a business where certain people are congregating outside of the business, those kinds of things. So we wanted to really create a balanced, some balanced language that um, acknowledged that we also have to support the business owners in downtown Northampton and downtown Florence. And so you'll see in two different locations in the new language, um, something that really refers to um, unfettered access to venues and locations. And we made sure to say commercials, formal and informal, because we wanted to talk about access into parks, um, access to commercial businesses, and just any, any location that people want to get to, they should be able to get to um, in an unfettered way. So that's one of the pieces that we made sure to put in there. The piece around the trees, that was brand new language, um, because we heard in both, um, I think in both hearings we heard about uh, shade trees being a really important piece of uh, what makes a sidewalk vibrant, what makes our downtown a place where people want to be. Um, so that language was added. Um, we put in a little bit more about public art because we heard in one of the hearings that people thought that um, public art didn't only beautify, but it, it engaged the public in its creation. Um, so that is some new language that's in here. So um, we made sure too to make the language a little bit more universal, so that we talked about people not walking from one place to another, but uh, that movement of people. We talked about movement of people as opposed to people walking from one place to another. So there are also some more subtle things that were changed based on the public comment that we heard. Council Labar, you want to Yes, to and also to um, had Bill Newman, who attended our hearing in Florence, and I know Councilor Klein had suggested that that certain language from Bill Newman also also should have been included in the resolution, specifically under Article 16 of the Massachusetts De Declaration of Rights. Freedom of expression is protected activity. So we did look at that. Carefully. Councilor Adams also worked on that section quite a bit. I know that you should know that Councilor Adams uh, devoted a lot of work on that. He did. Uh, did yeah. indeed. Uh, I just want to. I just want to thank the committee and the councilors who did an enormous amount of work in terms of bringing in what were um, <coughs> strongly worded. Uh, uh, objections and exceptions to the original language and made it much more um, 
one that could be agreed on by the rest of the body, or at least by those who are in the public. So I appreciate that. Um, Council LaBarge and then Council Arthur. Yes, and I myself, as the chair, also want to thank Council Jesse Adams for really working tirelessly with us and helping us with the language. And also the two counselors, Gina Luisiera and Alyssa. I mean, we put our heads together and I think we've made something that many people were involved in and hopefully this will expand and this will happen. Councilor Adams. This resolution has come a long way since the first draft and the, the intent is still there and the spirit's still there. But um, I hope some people who are interested in this subject will take the time to read what it's become because it really, really is a much more inclusive document. And the committee did work, to, I've work incorporating public comment to a level that I haven't seen in any measure um, in my time so far on the council. And it really is a much more broad, inclusive document now. And I think assuaged a lot of the concerns that were met initially with the resolution. I'd like to add my thanks. I think that, that as I said, we wanted to spur a conversation and a discussion. One that, that actually is often deferred and usually comes up uh, in the summer when points of conflict start to occur, more people congregate downtown. And, and the, the issue that sort of stimulated this, the proposal of this resolution, um, uh, you know, rather than, Councilor Carney and I were discussing this at the time, that rather than um, <coughs> getting some kind of tit for tat war and then finger pointing kind of blame type of thing, that the idea was to promote exactly what occurred, albeit over a long time. <laughs> but it was the conversation that we tend to ignore until conflicts flare up. And it was appropriate that we had a discussion when, and, and, and as Councilor Adams pointed out, this uh, normally when we've had these discussions, it's usually um, it's essentially hearing from the, the vested interests of the downtown businesses who are expressing concern in the, in the impact on their, in their, on their businesses. We rarely heard from people who represented social service agencies or the people who received the, the, the benefits of those social service agencies. We were, there was a, a large portion of the community that was removed from the conversation. Not removed, but just never invited to participate necessarily. And they, in this instance, they were. And that makes a big difference. I'm actually, I'm very pleased with the conversation. I'm, I, and, and again, it's, it was restating some things that we may have presumed and assumed, but were never actually chronicled or documented. And we have an opportunity here with this resolution to actually uh, codify it. Well, not codify it, but indemnify it in some way. So that I, I'm very grateful that you guys, I know that it was a lot of work, um, and I'm actually grateful to see something come out of SSVCR, actually a recommendation, a committee that we haven't had a lot of opportunity to refer things to and then get things referred back. So I'm glad that we've got, uh, we actually have a, a piece of legislation, if you will, that comes out of there. So uh, is there any discussion on the amendments or the proposed language or? Um, well then, all those in favor of the resolution as amended, would they please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? It's unanimous. It is passed in second reading. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, possibly a record gap in between introduction and passage. But thank you all very much for your good work. Um, no presentations. No licenses and petitions. Uh, I'll accept a motion to approve the minutes. Move to approve. Um, Second. Thanks. Councilor Shara. I just have a couple. I, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I leaped over the one minute announcement part. Oh, no, I don't have any minutes. Okay, all right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, you have, uh, this is relevant to the minutes, though? We'll get to it after the minutes. How's that? This is relevant to the minutes. Yeah, okay. Just two things that I saw um, on page 313. Um, fifth paragraph, I actually said the project was modified to have 100% more retail space, not 50%. It doubled, so instead of 50%, that should be 
Um, and then the other thing is it says that Councilor Specter seconded the adjournment. Um, it would have been really nice for you to do that for us, but you weren't here. I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> he had a very <laughs> long adjournment. I was thinking it. You <laughs> did. You did. You're in spirit. That's the. It's the last page. The end, oh, so be polite. Yeah, <laughs> he said he seconded the adjournment, but. I don't know who did. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been me. Probably Councilor Carney. Well, no, she, she, she made the motion, though. And second, oh. she's really very <laughs> handy. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I, we clearly adjourned, so we weren't trapped here. So that's usually done. And that was a very, very, very long meeting. So. Um, uh, I'll accept the. All right. I, uh, all those in favor of accepting the minutes as amended, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstentions? <coughs> uh, next, one minute announcements. How's that? Um, I know you counselors received an email. <laughs> um, there is going to be a um, presentation and a roundtable discussion and summary. Um, the sponsors are United Way of Hampshire County, the Cooley Dixon Hospital, and also Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And that is going to be held on Wednesday, February 11th, at the Clarendon Hotel from 8.30 until 11.30. <coughs> and I'm hearing that it's going to be excellent, and I've already put my name on it so I could be included on that round table, especially about... Um, our health care system here in the city about transportation to getting to people who need the help so I'm hoping that you counselors look at that very carefully because we all were invited for that Councilor uh, I, I don't have all the details but the Valley CDC has a community forum this Saturday did someone already announce that no Oh, no. that's so it's this Saturday and if someone has better details than me because I wasn't able to uh, I can pull it up right there. Um, I, don't know, I, think, I think it is important. Uh, the community right. summit is this Saturday, February 7th, and it starts at 9 a.m. Breakfast and networking, and then it goes from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 with the community summit convenes. It's at the Northampton Senior Center in the Great Room. And asks for an RSVP to a phone number? Right. The phone number, uh, well, it's just, well, here's a click a point for the RSVP. I see no phone number. I think number you could this. just go to the Valley CDC website, website and, and yeah. RSVP. Yeah. Right. Is there, I don't see a phone number. Okay. Um, any other one minute announcements? Okay. Uh, I'll accept a motion to for on the committee minutes uh, for the or, for ordinance and also for SSVCR. Move to approve them. Second. The motions <coughs> made to approve them both. As a, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, now we come to the point where I see the gavel to. Uh, Council Murphy, who will chair finance as we go into recess from the regular meeting. Council Murphy. Thank you. Pam, you could you call a roll for finance? Murphy. I'm here. Councilor Adams. Here. Present. Councilor Lavarge. Present. Here. Excellent. Can I have a yes, Councilor Adams? The Lumberyard Project never left finance. The what? The yeah, it's, li it's listed under finance. I think it did. He left finance before, so it's actually, I don't think it's. I think it, it doesn't deserve to be here again since. Because with this was the second reading, the original reading was. Yeah, so. Two it, or three sessions ago. I don't know. I think it was just. It's in the, it, it's in the agenda here, but it's, it shouldn't be. Finance at the last one. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it's gone from there because it, it moved to full council. So that is, a, that is an error. But. We do have other things in finance, but first, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? Of Move to approve the minutes. Second. Aye. Second. Aye. Excellent. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Okay. Good. <laughs> Moving right along, then. Um, the mayor's poised on this one. 
Upon the recommendation of the mayor, order that the city council approve a $200 budget for the youth commission to be used for supplies and meeting expenses during the fiscal year of 2015. The expenditures to come from the mayor's youth commission gift fund. Any comment, Mr. Mayor? No. Uh, this is just funding to help support some of the planned activities of the youth commission for the coming year. Um, we have a gift fund that has a balance of about $2,700 that's been accumulated over time from various gifts. Mm -hmm. And this is the process, as we know, from other mm -hmm. funds like this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that this is what we have to do to actually pull some of that money out to give them a budget to work with. Excellent. Um, do we have a motion on this, by the way? Yeah, no. We'll send it forward. Uh, Second. Second. All right. Any discussion on $200 for the I, I, I serve as the council uh, liaison to the youth commission, and I should say that the reason for this request for the two hundred dollars is the youth commission actually, as the mayor pointed out, raised that money to begin with, but they need access to it. But largely due to the fact that they are embarking on a project that actually is relevant to a lot of the conversations that we had, they are trying to get off the ground a an art project using the city bank. Um, they are actually doing yeoman's work, and I need to keep them in the room with pizza. And that's they need access to the funds to do that. But this is actually this project is visionary. It's, it's it conforms with the vibrant sidewalk discussion we had. It also conforms with inclusion in the in the, in the community and public art, and all of that. And I, there, the youth commission is taking the lead. And I think the least we can do is let them eat, uh, you know, saturated fats and stuff. so. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Um, Mayor, would there be, would you feel good about us doing two readings on this and spending it? Uh, that would be fine. Again, this is funds that have already, that are already there. There's no urgency for it, but the count, I'm, I'll defer to the council president. There's, there's, I would be fronting the pizza money to begin with anyway, so they can reclaim it at their, at their convenience. So it's, I don't see a necessity for two readings, but. I'm, I'm grateful that you consider it, but. So, uh, in you can do a hundred at this meeting and a hundred at the next <laughs> meeting. <laughs> I know. A lot of people. That's the end. So, all in favor of $200 for the Youth Commission, positive recommendation? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Okay. The next one's for slightly more money. On the recommendation of the mayor, order that the city appropriates the amount of 900 and one, $901,554 for the purpose of paying costs for the partial replacement of the roof at the Ryan Road School, uh, located on Ryan Road. Uh, a school serving public students in grades kindergarten through five, including the payment of all costs incidental or related to the project, which uh, proposed to re repair project would materially extend the useful life of the school and preserve an asset that otherwise is capable of supporting requirements of educational program for which the city has applied for a grant from the Massachusetts School Building Authority uh, set amount to be expended under the direction of the school committee to meet this appropriation the, tr the treasurer with the approval of the mayor is authorized to borrow set amounts under Mass General Law Chapter 44 or pursuant to any other enabling authority the city acknowledges um, that the Massachusetts School Building Authority's grant program is a non-entitlement discretionary program based on need as determined by the building authority. Any project costs the city incurs in excess of the grant may be approved by and received from the building authority. Um, any grant the city may receive from the <coughs> building authority for projects shall not exceed the lesser of 56 uh, and 26 hundredths, 56 0.26% of eligible uh, approved project costs as determined by the building authority or the total maximum grant amount determined by the building authority and that total amount of borrowing authorized pursuant to this order shall be reduced by any grant amount set forth in the project funding agreement that may be executed between the city and the building authority for the project. <coughs> Okay, Mr. Mayor, any comments on this? One? Well, while I would love to take credit for that amazing prose, uh, <laughs> that's actually uh, boilerplate language that we are required to use. Um, the MSBA, the Mass School Business Authority, um, requires that we use that exact language. And so, mm -hmm. essentially, um, uh, under the accelerated uh, repair program, uh, we'll be working on this roof and another school roof. and. Uh, much like the grants we often um, receive from the state and we have to actually um, 
appropriate the full amount of the money, um, this full uh, funds will not actually be appropriated and used because we'll be getting, um, for example, of this 901.554, we'll receive um, an MSBA reimbursement of $605,669. So of the 901 that you're appropriating here, um, we'll end up paying uh, 295 885 of that. Uh, we've already appropriated 175 in an earlier capital project, so that gets bundled towards this. But so even though it's a large number on a, a slightly over a million dollar project, uh, the MSBA will be reimbursing us that 56 and 26 hundredths percent on the project. So, um, so we would really appreciate your your uh, approval. These are two. This this is one of a couple big projects that will be much easier for us to accomplish having this state grant. Excellent. Before we do questions, can we have a motion to put this on the floor? Make a motion to put it on. Second. Okay. Uh, Council of Bar, do you have a question? Yes, Mayor. What would be the total cost because we're looking at a partial replacement to do a whole complete roof? Why are we doing a partial? Yeah, we had already done some work on it in the past. Way um, back. When we had, uh, when we were trying to do this under capital improvements, we were basically doing it in sections. Okay. And so this will, this will, uh, you know, finish it and, and make the roof, uh, you know, weatherproof. Uh, but this was the remaining, you know, chunk of the project. We had kind of, Mr. Pomerantz and his team had tried to figure out a way to split it up into smaller chunks because it was such a large expenditure. Um, and then we have the other roof at Jackson that we're trying to deal with as well. So, so that's why uh, that's why it says partial. Yeah. Any other questions about this one in finance? Jack leads. Sorry. Hearing none. Um, all in favor aye. of the positive recommendation, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. All right. Um, and this one is strikingly similar. <laughs> so I might read you the salient parts rather than all the tongue twisting legalese. Uh, this one is for the Leeds Elementary School, 20 Florence Street in Leeds. It is for more partial roof work for $491,486, and it would get the same 56.26% reimbursement. So um, same language as Ryan Road School, $491,486, same reimbursement, and it's for the Leeds School. Do we have a motion on this one? Make a motion. Second. 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 Okay. Uh, anything different on this one? Just, you know, again, of this 491, 486, the state will reimburse us 374,965. Mm -hmm. um, we've already, again, as with the other project, we had already put 175, appropriated it mm -hmm. back when we were trying to do this under a capital program. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so this again will be a, a major, uh, a major boost to uh, getting these two projects done. Excellent. Any more questions in finance? No. Nope. All in favor of a positive recommendation, say aye. 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 Opposed? Um, and then a, a very seasonal one on the recommendation of the mayor, order that pursuant to chapter, chapter 44, subsection 31D of the Massachusetts General Laws, the Northampton City Council approves the expenditure of funds for the purpose of snow and ice removal in excess of the funds appropriated for such purpose in 2015. Do we have a recommendation on this one? So recommend second. All right, second. and that, do you have a? This is a seasonal. Event. It's a seasonal thing. I just I thought I would at least uh, I did a, little, did a little chart just to kind of show you, you know where we where we where we've been for snow and ice. Obviously, um, we appropriated uh, we budgeted for twenty six three fifty. I believe you received a memo uh, <coughs> that I shared with you um, from Mr. Huntley that uh, describes uh, the expenditures that we've made to date and how we're getting perilously close to the to the using up that entire amount um, including a large shipment of uh, sand that we're expecting uh, that's on order um, and then if you're out driving around downtown tonight you'll see uh, about 20 28 employees and 23 vehicles who will be working starting at midnight uh, about 11, 11 uh, p.m. to be doing overnight work uh, doing snow removal so between the PS budget and the O&M budget uh, we need to invoke the um, deficit spending the chart I showed you just shows you um, the light blue is uh, is what we budgeted in those years in our budget and the dark blue just shows you um, what Mother Nature charged us uh, in terms of that year. Okay. 
looking at this, is it that it's is, is this what's happening here, which is that you know, of course, we're um, that what we actually spend is a lot more than we budget. Is it indicative of of of, of both the unpredictability as well as um, the really non necessity of, of of budgeting very accurately because we can deficit spend? Well, if you notice, I, one of the features of my 2013 budget, um, you know was we were trying, you may remember, we were trying to more accurately or closely budget for some of these items like snow and ice and veterans and legal so that we wouldn't have to come back for too many transfers. Um, so you'll see, for example, you know, in 2000, from 2012 to 2013, we started using like a three to five year average. So we boosted it up to, um, you know, up to the current range of 426, 350. Um, and, you know, we may, in fact, increase it. We were talking today and looking at the five year average now, we may need to go up even a little bit higher. Um, again, it's all a matter of you're going to pay now or pay later. And and um, and so we would have to depend on free cash uh, to come back to replenish it. So you want to sort of be accurate but with but also you want to be careful because the way the deficit spending law works if you set the once you set the bar somewhere um, you can't um, you can't lower lower that bar back down again for purposes of deficit spending so it's uh, so we want to be we don't want to get too close but we want to we, we don't want to also um, have you know we were at one point um, you know we were still budgeting about 300,000 when we were you know spending eight uh, you know four six hundred eight hundred you know that kind of stuff so we're trying to get a little bit closer but we're yeah we do have the luxury of of not having to budget accurately um we also have the luxury of not being able to predict the weather so His, history has shown that insurance for for this does it, wouldn't benefit us financially isn't that right we we did we did utilize the insurance in the uh for for an extended period of time and we have checked out the insurance um you know a lot of communities did really well with the insurance um and then of course they uh you know readjusted and jacked up their rates and and raised the snow totals and made a lot of changes so it was no longer um so we stopped uh buying the insurance and we stopped while we were ahead and I know the DPW has investigated it every year, but the premiums are quite excessive, and you have to, you know, it's a, it, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a risk that you have to take, um, that you're gonna reach the the total that you need to reach in order to um, get the payoff, you know, get the insurance, invoke the insurance. Otherwise, you're gonna, you know, spend the money and spend the insurance premium. So, um, so yeah, it, it's something that they've looked at. Um, and it was popular for a while, uh, and then everybody, you know, then we had uh, must have had a really bad winter, and and the insurance companies had to pay out. So funny thing about insurance companies, when you win and they don't, they raise your rates. Yes, <laughs> they figured it out. Exactly. Yeah. Final question: Did the three categories <clears throat> that we can budget uh, deficit spend is it, it's it's legal snow and ice and veterans? Well, actually, no. Um, we can't deficit spend in um, veterans or in. Um, or in uh, what what it means by deficit spending is um, is that we you know under finance law you really can't make an expenditure unless you have appropriated that money um, and this allows you to do that um, knowing that you know there may be five snowstorms between now and the next meeting and we and short of calling an emergency city council meeting and having you guys quickly transfer some money in um, with legal and with um, I mean really with any other budget category you can exceed your budget but you really can't spend beyond it without coming to the to the legislative body and getting the funds transferred back in so this is actually the only category that you can actually you know if we only have two hundred thousand left in the account and we have a three hundred thousand dollar bill we can actually pay the bill legally. We're allowed to deficit spend, um, knowing that we can come to the council at the end of the year and, and true up the budget. Yeah, Absolutely. I think it's just really because of the fact that it's weather and you it's too yeah, unpredictable. It's, it's unpredictable, and as long as we yeah. budget the same amount we did in the previous year, yeah, then we can spend what it takes to deal with snow and ice and balance the books later. Yeah, every other account you've got to do it before. With snow and ice, they let you do it. If you've if you budgeted the same amount as last year, they'll let you go ahead and spend the money, and then 
even off the accounts at the end of the season, which is just respectful of weather in New England. Yeah, just the way it is. And the states in deficits in deficit on their snow and ice as well right now. So not surprisingly. Yeah. Um, so on this one, uh, there's no <laughs> further questions. Uh, all in favor of a positive recommendation? Aye. 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 Opposed? Excellent. And then uh, my understanding, I, I, I'm fairly certain on one that's just, ex just you know, invoking a general law. I don't know that we need, I don't think we do two readings on this. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, in the, you mean in the, the full meeting? In the full meeting. I, I don't know. Um, uh, generally, when we're accepting a local act or a general law, I don't know that we, or, or you know, a, a, a poll permit or something like that. I don't know. But I just, depending on how you rule on that, I would like to make sure this is the final vote tonight. I don't want to wait another, you know, two weeks, um, especially since there's another storm coming Sunday. Yeah. So, yeah. I'd be inclined to do two to be safe. Yeah. Just yeah. to be safe. Okay. And then the last one um, is upon the recommendation of the mayor. This is a budgetary transfer of $55,919 um, from the reserve for personnel to the police department to cover the settlement that was spoken of earlier in the day. Yeah. And the, yeah, this is basically to pay um, FY15 mm -hmm. wages, uh, modified FY15 wages. So do we have a motion on this one? Make a motion. Second. All right. Any more discussion on this one? Then all in favor of a positive Aye. recommendation? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. Then uh, that being the end of the agenda, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. We reconvene back on the in the break <clears throat> back to our regular business and we'll start off with the financial order for the youth commission supplies a meeting of uh, the amount of two hundred dollars. This is at first reading. I'll accept a motion. Second. Any further discussion on this issue? All those. Oh, I'm sorry. Roll call. Yes. Yes. Council Lazar. Yes. Council Murphy. Yes. 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 Uh, and uh, that is passing. Next up is the financial order for the Ryan Road School roof repair. It's the first reading. Second. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Uh, now that passes in first reading. The financial order for the partial roof replacement for Leeds Elementary School. Move oh, approval. There's a motion made. Second. Second. Uh, any further discussion? Roll call, please. Council Murphy? Yes. Council Yes. 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 I knew you were um, financial order to approve funds for snow and ice removal. And this is a so first moved. reading. Second it. Any further discussion on this? Roll call. Council O'Donnell? Yes. Council Sherrill? Yes. Council Sherrill? Yes. Council Sherrill? Yes. 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 Suspend rule 14. Second. Motions are made and seconded to suspend rules. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any, any abstentions? Uh, any further discussion? I'll accept a motion for Move second. The second. Second it. Second. And the Council Respect is going to like to move the question, so uh, roll call, please. Yes. 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 That order has been approved in two readings. <clears throat> Next up is the financial order for FY 2015 budgetary transfers. This is to the police department. I'll accept a motion to put it on the board. approve. Second. Any further discussion on this? Ready for that roll call? Okay. Yes. Yes. 
Carney? Yes. 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 Suspend rule 14 now. Second. Motion is made and seconded to suspend rules. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Accept a motion for it for second reading. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor White? Yes. Councilor Fine? Yes. Councilor Lavar? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Donald? Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Yes. That is passed in two readings. So the transfer is complete. Uh, next up, we come up to second readings. Uh, this is the financial order for the budgetary transfers, the financial order for budgetary transfers. Uh, two meetings ago, Council Shackle and Peter Moore's came to mind. I'm sure he's up to speed on it. So uh, I'll accept the motion put on the floor. Motel, so. Second. Any further discussion on this item? Yes. 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 That passes in second reading. And then next up is the second reading for the financial order to appropriate free ca cash for Vento transportation. I'll accept your motion. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 That passes in second reading. Uh, this is the second reading for the financial order to appropriate free cash for stabilization and capital stabilization. Um, at the risk of embarrassing myself, I'll ask anyway if we've done item H, uh, financial order for budgetary transfers. Yes, we did. I know. No, we didn't. Good call. We didn't we do did, that. We did parking spaces, and then we jumped to McKinney Vento. Actually, we didn't do parking spaces. I, I had actually said financial orders for budgetary transfers. So we actually oh, I'm sorry. I guess H. that's what I meant. Yeah. We did H. I missed, I missed, G. I missed G. the trash. Okay. <laughs> Well, your um, turn to take out the trash. I'll, I'll, I will uh, we'll, we'll circle back to that. We're actually, uh, now that we've introduced this motion, for the uh, appropriate, the free cash for stabilization, capital stabilization, I accept a motion on that. And so moved. Second. 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 Okay. And any further discussion on that? And we'll please. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 All right. Now, item G. It's a financial order to surplus parking spaces for trash receptacles that uh, the dumpsters, if you will, in the full parking lots. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. And, and just a comment because I've had somebody ask me about this. These are the ones that are there already and been there for a long time. So this doesn't, this does not institute a change. This is just our approving the policy. We, we need to reapprove for the dumpsters that have been there all along. To, to authorize the, the, the use of that space. So these are the dumpsters you see at Armory Street, the Masonic Street lot. Um, I forgot one of the other ones. Are, that's the, the dumpsters are used by the businesses there. No new ones, just no new ones, ones nothing new, and nothing's okay. leaving. Uh, any further discussion? No. Roll call, please. Councilor Lavar. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Now we're up to the orders and ordinances, and this so the first one up is the order to accept as a public roadway Scanlon Avenue, and this comes with a positive recommendation from the Board of Public Works and the Planning Board. Uh, back in December of uh, December 11th this year. This is the second reading. I'll accept the motion. Move to approve. Second. Second. Further discussion on this item. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 We also have a second reading for an ordinance regarding the compensation for elected officials of the city council. Move to approve. Report. Second. Uh, I bet there's some discussion. Uh, 
Inspector, you would. Yeah, though this was not exactly the package I would have supported from the beginning, I will vote for this tonight. <clears throat> As I said before, I, I'm not running for re-election. I've announced that. And I just want to say, I think this, again, I think I said this last time, that I don't think there's any question in terms of the amount of work and that people put into this. And as someone said tonight that we should donate all of this to, I forgot the program, but it was a worthy cause. But I would say, you know, people in this council are already donating quite a bit. And that there, in some ways, yes, it is a public service, and you could talk about it as we should just volunteer our time. And I think we are volunteering our time, and I think all of you are, and I think you deserve this raise, um, and then some. Um, but given the budgetary constraints in the city, I think this is a reasonable amount. I think it's always a challenge for all of you to vote for something that could affect you in the future. And it, it actually takes a little courage to do that. It's not like, oh, look at what they're doing. You know, I think it actually, t for all of you, I know it's hard to do that, knowing that people criticize you for it. So I actually applaud you for it. I think you deserve it, and I'm glad to support it. Uh, Council Murphy. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, for one, I'm a counselor that takes the health insurance benefit. And uh, one of my constituents that I explained said, please point out the fact that like every other city employee, we pay a portion of that. So we're the same as everybody else. So we get a $5,000 stipend as ward counselors, and we pay the same percentage to take advantage of the health insurance that every other city employee does. Um, that being said, though the stipend hasn't changed in 24 or 25 years, for those of us that accept the health insurance, the value of that health insurance, I feel, has increased and therefore kept pace with what our compensation should be overall. So for those of us that take the health insurance, the value of that has increased over those 24 or 25 years to keep our compensation competitive. But there are counselors that do not accept the health insurance. And I feel that they are due, because they don't take the health insurance, the value of what they receive from the city has not increased over that time frame. So I have no trouble with a counselor who does not accept the health insurance benefit getting the higher amount for parity over that 24, 25 years. So I certainly would like you all to consider the fact that the $5,000 stipend with the health insurance is in fact a contemporary compensation. But to allow counselors who, who elect not to take the health insurance to get the higher amount because they have not benefited from the increase in value of the health insurance over the years. And I want to throw that out and see if that concept of that works for anybody. Uh, to that point or any other point, Councilor Adams? Are you making a motion to decrease compensation based on the, you know? Well, I would, I, yeah, to, for purpose of discussion, I would make a motion that the stipend remain the same for counselors that accept the health and participate in the health insurance but for counselors that do not accept the health insurance benefit that they are entitled to the higher stipend recommended did uh, was there I just a second a for the motion did, Wait. Oh, sorry it's a, there's a motion for I'll, I'll second discussion. it for there you go of discussion but may I ask a question yeah. uh, I'm not sure that's legal but have you talked to anybody uh, if you, oh I have because I'm actually not sure right. that you can do that mm -hmm. from a legal standpoint of saying if you take the benefit so I'd be curious to even know if we could do that even if we wanted to. I don't think we can. And I don't have the answer to that question. Okay. I just uh, want to Council throw it out. Bart. Yeah, I have to say I agree with Consular Specter. I think there's a legal issue here. And I also feel I think we do have our rights to say we don't need the health insurance. And I don't think that we should be punished because we don't get the health insurance. You get the health insurance, that's your choice. I, I'd like to comment on this on one point. Is that the fact is that, that we've identified there's no other position that, of course, would have to adjust its salary based on whether they take the insurance or not. Exactly. And, and the problem is, is we're defining, and this has been my issue all along, that we're defining the health insurance as some form of compensation for work when point in fact it is it, my perspective that it's the employer's obligation, in this case the city, to provide 
health care coverage in the absence of a national standard that's arrived at, that's, that's actually equivalent to providing them a safe place to work. And mm -hmm. you don't make an adjustment in their salary to do that. And I think, and the only reason I, I comment on that is what we do, if we establish precedent here, then we've established a different perspective and an assumption of what it means to receive health insurance. And that means that we're making, and this is my argument before uh, when we were talking about the issue of health insurance. In attaching it to the stipend, I think, is problematic. I think it, because of that, because what it does is it redefines what the real purpose of health insurance is for, which is to provide health care coverage for people who do services for the, the city. That said, I mean, I think, you know, the issue of the compensation and the stipend, of course, as everyone's pointed out, as Councilor Specter pointed out, it's essentially the third rail, and I think we went on about that already, and it's, it's a political poison pill. But um, we had discussed the last time was the prospect of talking about fielding some ideas like this, checking out the legality of something like this or some other thing. And my hope was to talk about it further, to f think about what we could do to entice people who might preclude the co thought of running for council and making this a more representative body because it just it isn't fiscally possible. And um, in thinking that maybe we could come up with new creative ideas that haven't actually been explored yet in the state. We go by all the state standards here. We heard a lot about benchmarks. But I would like to explore that. I mean, what I'd like us to consider is actually uh, turning this down, existing and going with the stipend that we have currently. Um, and by the way, when we vote this in, we're not voting this in for ourselves. We're voting this in for whoever's sitting here the next time. Uh, we may all get defeated because we've raised our salaries or something, and it might be the people who, who inherit our positions. But I would like us to think if we could, def if we defeat the proposal tonight for the expansion with the understanding that we going forward we're trying to develop some alternative, and maybe it's this, maybe it's what's already being presented again, but as a council researching this and make this decision before the June deadline um, uh, so that it doesn't go into the next session. That's just a recommendation. So, uh, Councilor Adams. Two points, just with respect to Councilor Murphy's motion. Um, for one, the legality of the proposal should be considered further and also should take into consideration it's possible that someone who doesn't get health insurance now may opt to at a later point and that would require an adjustment in their compensation or vice versa. But, um, but also, we already voted to maintain the health insurance benefits. That's not even before us tonight. Mm -hmm. So it would require ordinance, it would require amendments to both ordinances and bringing that one back first and synchronizing them somehow and, and, and amending them both, perhaps. Councilman. Although the health benefit is offered to us now, but not all of us choose to take it. You know, we were not forced to take it. Um, but some, but uh, some could take. Well, hang on a second. Yeah, actually, Councilor Carney, you haven't spoken yeah. yet, so go. Well, ahead. I just said that, although some of us don't take it, presently right now, the way that the law is is that any circumstance could put you in a position where you might take it immediately. Mm -hmm. Should be loss of another health care, mm -hmm. or loss of a spouse's health care uh, benefits. So. It seems like it, it seems it's complicated, and I'd rather leave things separate regarding those two matters. Councilor O'Donnell. I think that um, in the process so far, there's been some things that have been missing, and among them ha has been what the council president has brought up, what I heard Councilor Klein bring up in previous meetings, which is the larger values we're trying to accomplish, rather than just picking a number. And so I'm inclined to agree that if we were to go back and look at some of these other proposals, like the one Councillor Murphy raises, which I think is interesting, I'm, I'm not sure I'm convinced of it right now, but it's certainly worth looking at, or the ones that Council Presidents brought up in the past, I think that has to go through a similar process that has, that, that has not just the, the fact of integrity, but the appearance, appearance of integrity as far as the public, public is concerned, rather than take what we have now and start tinkering with it. Um, and I, that sounds sort of, you know, derogatory. It's certainly within our, our, our power to tinker, and I'm all in favor of, of, of tinkering and amending. I think that is actually a good, healthy process. But for this process, I really think that we have to resist that a little bit, and we really should have kind of an up or down vote on what we have before us, and then revisit it if necessary. Um, 
However, you know, I'll explain my vote that I explained in December because there was some question at the last meeting about um, my position. I'll just restate it briefly. I'm going to vote no on this because we have untethered the health care benefit, which I support retaining from the stipend increases, and therefore I don't feel we're acting on clear recommendations from a neutral body. And again, that gets back to my concern. We need to, and we need to have a process here. Even if we come up with the right answer tonight, which we might, it doesn't matter. I still feel we, we ought not to do it in this way. So. Point of information? Yes. We're actually voting on the motion that Councillor Murphy put yeah, forward, for which is whether to do something with well okay yeah that's true um that that is true so that's actually, one you have on the table now this is this to the the kind of the amendment yeah, the one that murphy and you seconded yeah they have just the amendment this, this is to the amendment or this to the i mean well, we can vote on the amendment if if you it, it ties into the other because i would suggest we table the amendment until we find out some of the legal um, issues around it but, but and then it would lead to my second thing, which is a, another discussion about what to do with the larger. I, and I'm happy to withdraw it um, be, from further consideration for today. I, you know, it's in people's minds. You can think about it. I'm happy to withdraw it for the time being. So my suggestion, rather than vote down, um, I, I don't call it tinkering. This, this group, and, and remember, I would think I was one of the few who voted against this, but this body very strongly said, no, we're going to continue the health care benefit. It's already been voted on. So really, the other piece of this, I mean, if someone educate me, the other piece is the compensation piece. And so it's not tinkering, but rather than start all over again, I would say, how about tabling it till there can be more discussion on it? I'm just a little concerned if you vote it down, what do you, why vote it down? I mean, are you going to start again with another committee? Well, the, or are you going to? That's possible. The reason for my recommendation is I would actually like this aspect of the, of the recommendation that came forward to us to be addressed and, and completed uh, as opposed to tabling. I think that, and then the process beyond that we have to own, that we take authorship in some level, and if that requires us to solicit a new committee, uh, because the form you weren't here, but the former committee members all said to a person that they're not interested in being involved in anything like this ever again. Point of <laughs> information is the, re the the motion was withdrawn, I believe. Uh, well, yes. the amendment was. Yeah, the amendment. The amendment. The amendment. Yeah, so we're on the original motion yeah. now. The original yeah. motion now. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and, and this is to Councilor Specter's point. So that that was the only reason I was recommending that we vote on this up or down, as Councilor right. O'Donnell said. My recommendation would be down, and um, that we. Uh, nothing's going to change as, our, as far as our circumstances are now. Our stipends will be the same. Our insurance, if we take it, will be the same. Um, but we have a June deadline in order to make it work and be effective to be enacted at the subsequent council that's elected. So at that point, yeah. hopefully in, the, in that time, we get our act together okay. to uh, convene So, so just my, my piece on this would be I would strongly oppose setting up a new committee. Okay. You already uh, had a um, committee. I know. I, I, I defer back to uh, Councilor Adams' recommendation at the last meeting that at this point we've talked this through and we should vote this. I'm in favor of voting for the salary increase, which was recommended by the committee and which even uh, the uh, Dennis Helmus made a point of saying that even though we may reject the recommendation regarding health insurance, he does hope that we would give ourselves a raise. And my sense is that I didn't get the consensus from the whole committee, but my sense is that it's been 24 years and it's not an unreasonable raise to go from, it, it's actually less than what would be a COLA adjustment. And I would rather see us move forward on this and settle it. This evening, uh, Councillor uh, Labarge hasn't spoken yet. Yes. I am going to echo what Councillor Carney is talking about. I think the committee, there was a committee. I don't see having another committee. I think we should look at this very carefully this evening and vote on this. Councillor Adams, I, I agree with Councillor Carney. Uh, Councillor Sheriff. I, um, I appreciate that there seems to be an interest in exploring other options and trying to find a way to, to open up possibilities for 
a larger, more diverse group to do what we're doing right here. Um, so I'm concerned if we vote for this tonight that that, that process isn't going to happen. Councilor, there's actually nothing that stops that process from happening if we vote yes tonight or if we vote for this tonight. Uh, yeah, no. To that point, there is nothing th th that would stop that process. It's a question of how we figure out going forward. And my hope is, um, to Councilor O'Donnell's point, is that I, I think the stipend is is not a tip. I think the stipend actually should, uh, in some cases, serve as an enticement, if possible, for people who wouldn't otherwise consider. And as I said. I think the main purpose, hopefully, of the stipend is an opportunity to entice more people to get involved. We, we have a good and strong, thoughtful, deliberative body. I don't think we necessarily have a very diverse body reflecting the, the various constituencies in the community. Um, and, uh, you know, not that it impinges our service in any way, but it, our service can only be enhanced by hearing alternate voices and having alternate voices who might not otherwise consider. And I think we have an opportunity to actually take advantage of that. And we have an opportunity to be creative and try and come up with a legal binding way to establish compensation to include and promote diversity in the, in the council. So I'm, I'm perfectly, I'm, uh, clearly I'm in favor for a vote, up or down vote tonight. Uh, and then I don't, I'm, to Council Sherrill's point, I just don't want us to suddenly say, well, that's done, we're done. Um, so that's, that's all I got going with that. What's the question? So the question's been called. Um, so this is, as it stands, based on the recommendation of the, the increases that were proposed by the advisory committee um, uh, without amendments. Uh, roll call, please. Council Obama. No. Council Sarah. Yes. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Connie? Yes. Councilor Boyd? No. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Lavard? Yes. Councilor Murphy? No. It passed. The motion passes, uh, and the and that is so. And I, as I said, thank you, uh, thank you all for your discussion on this. Since I'm glad we had it. Um, I'm sure, there's some people watching. Which we never brought it up, but <laughs> I should point out we didn't bring it up. <laughs> I want that. To, I want the public to know that we didn't bring this up. We'd rather Fired swallow lie, but we. <laughs> I'm glad. As Councilor Spencer said it is, it is an aspect of bravery, although not one you get medals for. Um, the next up is uh, this is also second reading ordinance regarding the compens. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, for the school, school committee, for the elected uh, officials of the school committee and others. That would Good be question. the Smith Vocational Council. Second it. Uh, did you move the question before? Well, well I mean, move the proposal. Got it. Yeah. So it's in second reading. Got second. Got it. All right. The second reading. Motion's made and seconded for second reading. Um, discussion on these points. Councilor Brown. Same discussion adheres to this. <laughs> As right. Everyone's points remain the same, I would think. Uh, Okay. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Spratt. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Connie. Yes. Councilor Boyd. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Murphy. No. Councilor O'Donnell. No. No. It also passes in second reading. So. The next up is also in second reading. This is the ordinance to correct limited time parking in code section 312-109. Accept a motion, put it on the floor. Move approval. Okay, second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. 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 That passes in second reading. Um, I do have an update. Those of you who attended the MMA conference and have outstanding receipts, please get them to Pam so that she can process them and then shower them with large jet. Um, there is no, I have no other information to offer. There's no information request or any business. I'll accept the motion to move to adjourn. Second.
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you all very much.